Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to our research day for those of you who are here for the first time. Research day is designed to showcase research done by our trainees at all levels. And you'll hear a little bit more about that. Um, and, and so uh, we have a, a program that involves uh, oral presentations. Then we take a break for poster. There's also electronic posters that I encourage you to go take a look at. Then we'll have another session. We'll have an hour break and have a, give you a chance to look at the posters. And then we'll finish with, a, at least for the trainees part, with a, another set of oral presentations. And we take a short break and we have our keynote speaker, Tom Grist, who's in the audience from the University of Wisconsin. And I'm going to turn this over to my partner in crime. <laughs> it's hard to believe we've been joined at the hips doing this now for five years, but I'm going to turn it over to Craig Morris, who's the director of our residency program. Thank you, Bob. It's the Bob and Craig show, as we say. But I, I, Bob and I were reflecting on this a moment ago, is that this is year five, and this, this research day has really progressed into what we had dreamed and hoped that this would be. It's a great showcase of the, all the academic productivity and research in our department, which has grown and grown and grown each year. There are 10 phenomenal oral presentations today, 39 posters. The quality of research, the translational research, is just exciting to see. So we just encourage you to sit back and enjoy the day, ask questions at the break, go out and see the great uh, exhibits, the posters, talk to people. We think you're gonna enjoy this. The other thing I would say is we have expanded research today. Uh, this is the first time that our five-year clinical scientist track residents are now with us and in this program, and that's exciting. Plus we have educational, quality exhibits, so this day is just growing as we had hoped. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Linkensky, and we'll begin our program this afternoon. Um, before I start introducing the speakers, just a little logistical note. Um, for those of you who are speaking, uh, the time is eight minutes and two minutes for questions. If you look right in the middle of the first row here, Sonia Hill is here. She's going to hold up a little sign that tells you when you have, we, we didn't, we weren't able to wire this to give you sort of electronic notice, but she'll hold up a sign and wave it to get your attention. And then wave the second one even harder, because the first one will be telling you you have one minute left to wrap up, and then the second one will tell you it's time to stop, and then we'll move to questions. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce the first speaker. And, and the way we're going to do this, because these are all mentored uh, presentations, where then we'll recognize I think we should recognize the mentors for the hard work that they put into getting these presentations to the form that they're in. So our first speaker today is Jinzeng Wang, and the title of his talk is Whole Body MRI for Metastatic Cancer Detection Using T2-Weighted Imaging with Fat and Fluid Suppression, and his mentor is Anant Madaranthakam. Jinzeng. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, metastatic, uh, metastatic cancer uh, results in about 90% of human cancer deaths. It can spread to multiple organs. For example, the bone is a common site for metastasis. Medical imaging is one of the major techniques for the detection of metastasis, since it is non-invasive and can provide whole body coverage. Currently, multiple imaging modalities uh, have been proposed for the detection of metastasis such as CT and PET-CT. However, the CT has a low sensitivity. Although PET-CT has a higher sensitivity and specificity, the cost is high and uh, the availability is uh, limited. Bone scintigraphy is often used, but it is specific to bone metastasis. Uh, and uh, the sensitivity and the specificity are moderate. All these three techniques also use ionizing radiation which is a major concern in younger, uh, younger population as well as uh, repeat follow-ups. Currently, whole body MR has been proposed to detect metastasis. Specifically, whole body diffusion weight imaging has shown uh, promising sensitivity and specificity in the previous study. However, there are still a lot of challenges. Whole body diffusion weight imaging suffers from geometrical distortions, especially at 3T. For patients with metal implants, it can further reduce the image quality. Due to the T2 sign 3 effect, more B values are required to generate the ADC map. 
It also suffers from long scan time and low resolution. So all these things will limit, uh, will result in the uh, per localization and reduce the sensitivity. So the purpose of this study is to develop a whole body MR technique at 3D with improved lesion conspicuity and limited geometric distortion for metastatic cancer detection. In standard T2 weighted whole body MR, fat shows high signal intensity due to its long T2. So usually, fat suppression method like STIR is used to improve the lesion conspicuity, but sacrificing the SNR. Fluids also shows high signal intensity. It also can reduce <coughs> the lesion conspicuity and the specificity. So simultaneous fat and fluid suppression can help to improve the lesion conspicuity. To achieve this goal, we develop a sequence called DETECT, which acquire images uh, at a short TE and a long TE in a single uh, reputation. We also use multi-echo diction to acquire in-face and out-face images at both short TE and long TE. In total, four echoes are acquired following a single excitation, two echoes at short TE, two echoes at a long TE. Each set of images will go through the standard diction process. At short TE, we can achieve uniform fat suppression but, or water fat separation, but at long T, we observe the large water fat swaps. So we developed a uh, technique called shared film map diction, which will reuse the phase map estimate from the short T image to eliminate the water fat swaps. To suppress the fluid, we make a complex subtraction between the water only images at two different TE. Then we can generate the detect image with a simultaneous fat and fluid suppression. To reduce the geometric distortion, uh, actual acquisition usually used in diffusion with imaging, and then the image can be reformatted into a plan. But the scan time is proportional to the number of the slices. To reduce the scan time, coronal acquisition also can be used. However, in the coronal diffusion with imaging, we also can observe the similar geometric distortions. Uh, using the detector with a coronal acquisition, we can further reduce the scan time uh, as well as reduce the geometric distortion. Well, here you can see uh, the severe ge geometric distortion in the di uh, diffusion weight imaging. So we evaluate our sequences and reconstruction methods with five health volunteers and five patients with known metastatic renal cell carcinoma on Philips 3D engineer scanner. The whole body scan were Covered from uh, was covered with five stations from the head to the thumb uh, to the uh, knee. The detected images were acquired with uh, a, a higher implant resolution. Uh, in chest and abdominal section, we also use breath hold. So the total scan time with breath hold instructions for detect is about seven minutes. Uh, diffusion weight imaging takes about uh, 16 and a half minutes to complete the whole body scan. This is a result of a patient. The detector images, uh, can uh, we can identify the, all the lesions in the detector image, with, uh, which also can be identified in the uh, diffusion weight image. However, this patient has a metal implant, <coughs> implant in the uh, right femur. So diffusion weight imaging suffers from severe ge geometric distortion. It's hard to identify one lesion, which can be identified in the detect. Uh, due to the T2 sign through effect, uh, it's hard to identify one lesion in another patient in the brain, uh, in another patient's brain, um, in diffusion weight imaging, but it can be identified in the detect. This lesion uh, also confirmed on the previous uh, clinical scan. On the same patient, uh, in the diffusion weight Im imaging, we also can identify a lesion in the left femur but it's harder to, uh, to localize it. So we, we are not sure whether it is in the bone or out of the bone. But using detect, we can clearly see that uh, this lesion is in the bone. But for our detect, we also can provide a fat-only image, which can help us confirm the lesion is from the uh, bone and improve our confidence of localization. All the images were evaluated by consensus of three radiologists. In this table, you can see the detect can identify more lesions compared to the diffusion with imaging. 
for the last uh, patient, we can't finish the, uh, we can't complete the diffusion weighted whole body scan due to a significantly long scan time. So in conclusion, detect images show uniform fat and fluid suppression with high SNR. Detect sequence is also robust against the image distortion. It is time efficient uh, and uh, practical. Detect shows improved sensitivity as well as improved lesion localization in the pilot study. In the future, we will conduct more uh, prospective clinical validation to determine the sensitivity and the specificity. So at the last, I would like to thank my mentor and uh, all the people uh, contributed to this work, as well as the support from the NIH grant. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I forgot to mention that uh, Jin Zhang is uh, finishing his PhD this summer, and he's going to move down to Houston to take a job with GE. Are there any questions from anybody in the audience? Did you have to? Oh, sorry. It's a long way to cover from the top of the head to the middle of the thigh. Did you have to move the bore? Yeah. Were there stations? Yeah. Yes. And so, did this? Did you have trouble with the stations overlapping each other? Oh, uh, we have a bit of overlap, and then we can so then can we can attach all the stations and generate the whole body images. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any other? Yeah, Tom, Dr. Grist. Thank you. That's a very interesting technique. Um, so you did further fluid suppression by subtracting yeah. the two echoes. Yeah. So does that? How much does that affect the signal to noise? Uh, uh, do you lose much? Yeah, because uh, for the second T, we use a very long T. It's about 440 milliseconds. So most uh, uh, for the other soft tissue like uh, soft uh, gray and white matter, it already. It almost a decay to zero. We uh, we reduce a bit of the SNR, but not too much. I see. Yeah. So it really only uh, suppresses it, it subtracts long. the fluid, the yeah. stuff with a really long T2. Yeah. Long I see. Yeah. Okay. So so I have one last question. What took longer, uh, coding the sequence or coming up with the acronym? <laughs> <laughs> Probably both. <laughs> both. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Our next speaker is Chi Wang, and the title of his talk is Real-Time Confocal Microscopy of Biofilm on Metal Exposed to Alternating Magnetic Fields, AMF, in Antibiotics, and his mentor is Rajiv Chopra. Uh, thank you for the introdu introduction. Uh, the, my research is, uh, is basically to understand the uh, mechanism behind the uh, inter interaction of AMF antibiotics and uh, biofilms. Okay, first, uh, we know uh, total knee arthroplasty, uh, arthroplasty is a very common surgery um, that can relieve pain and restore function uh, to an arthritic knee. So there, there's a all, over one million procedures per year, and uh, b based on this prediction, there will be over three uh, million by 2030. However, about one to two percent of these procedures will experience infection after surgery. So nowadays, the treatment of the pro prosthetic joint uh, infection, PGI, uh, is mainly revision surgeries, which means to remove the old uh, infectious implant out first and then uh, do an extended antibiotic uh, treatment to the patient. And after that, uh, then put a new um, implant back. So it's very patient for uh, it's very um, very painful for the patient and uh, it's very costly. The annual cost uh, to treat the PGI uh, in the United States is about one billion dollars per year. And given the trend of the uh, procedures of TKA, you can imagine how much it will be reach by 2030. Uh, why is the PGI is to, so hard to treat? Um, because when the inf infection happens the uh, bacteria will attach on the surface of the Im implant, and th then the bacteria will secrete some uh, extracellular polymeric substance, EPIs, um, as a protection layer uh, for the uh, antibiotics. So the bacteria in the biofilm, uh, which forms biofilm, uh, 
the bacteria in the biofilm is much more resistant to antibiotics. So that's why uh, the infection related to uh, biofilm is too hard to treat. Um, to solve this, this, to solve this, our lab is wor uh, working on using uh, induction heating by, out uh, by high frequency alternating magnetic field (MF) uh, to eliminate the biofilm. As we learned in high school, uh, if we put a metal pe piece of metal in an alternating magnetic field (MF), there will be uh, induction current on the uh, uh, induction current, and then there will be heat generated. Um, uh, and uh, uh, if we use a higher high current, uh, frequency, um, the current will be only on the surface. Like here, when we put a um, metal cylinder in a EMF, and if we raise the frequency, you can see uh, the energy was almost deposited on the surface. So that's where the biofilm grows. So we, we anticipate to uh, eliminate the biofilm this way. Um, Moreover, because the uh, because, uh, MF only work on uh, uh, metal, so it has little in interaction with the soft tissue. Um, we've done some in vitro studies. We put a washer in uh, EMF. Uh, the EMF is generated by the solenoid coil, and the washer is also inoculated with uh, a pseudomonas uh, biofilm. And you can see after uh, like six minutes of uh, exposure, the numbers of bacteria um, there's uh, over f a four logs of reduction in the numbers of bacteria. And we have also done some research of the synergistic effect of EMF and uh, antibiotics. So uh, as you can see here, uh, for all those four concentrations uh, of uh, antibiotics, there's little effect uh, for, the for, the, for the bacteria if there's no uh, EMF. However, only after three minutes of uh, coil exposure, you can see the extended uh, uh, sensitivity of the bacteria to, uh, to the antibiotics. So it suggests there's some kind of uh, synergistic effect between the a AMF and uh, um, antibiotics. But how they work together and uh, what's the mechanism behind that? Um, to answer this question, we, uh, we build a compact EMF system that can fit on a microscope. So we expect to achieve real-time microscope, uh, microscopic image of biofilm with the uh, EMF. Uh, here is the structure of the, device, uh, of the system we built. Um, there's, this is a biofilm inoculated wash, uh, uh, stainless steel washer that can put in this flow cell. And uh, there's also media flowing in the flow cell to keep the vitality of the biofilm. Uh, this is a uh, printed circuit board based uh, planar coil that can place on the top with uh, which will generate AMF. Uh, then we did some uh, heat, uh, heating problems test on the microscope. Uh, this is a uh, planar coil that was covered with uh, a 3D print, uh, printed uh, water, water, cooling, water cooling jacket. And this is a flow cell and the tube, uh, there's a medium flow inside. So the temperature of the washer can reach as high as 70 degrees at max maximum power in 10 minutes. And uh, uh, it can reach about, about and keep 55 degrees uh, at uh, 8.5 watts. So that's the condition we use for the microscopy uh, later. Then we did, uh, we did some microscopy studies. Uh, we, uh, we use the a uh, live dead kit, uh, staining kit to stain the biofilm. So the dead ba live bacteria can stain green and uh, the dead bacteria is, uh, is stained red. So uh, we can monitor how the biofilm changes during the MF exposure. Also, uh, the biofilm EPS is stained, um, stained blue. Uh, you can see f uh, in the time series of uh, uh, maximum image uh, where the EMF is uh, is is, pos is posing. The the green color, which sh showing the uh, lab bacteria, is uh, decreasing, and uh, the red color uh, showing the dead bacteria in increased. Also, uh, the blue color, which shows the biofilm EPS 
uh, decreased. Uh, here's the animation. We show this process more clearly. Uh, you can find a spot like here. Um, it's apparently it's turning from green to right, and it's, the size is also diminishing. And you can also see from the side view, um, the thickness of the biofilm is uh, decreasing during the process. Okay, uh, after all, we, uh, we build a microscope com compatible uh, EMF system, and we have achieved some uh, biofilm elimination images uh, under the EMF uh, using a time-lapse microscope. And in the future, we can use this system uh, to do more synergy studies with antibiotics like to uh, find out uh, the mechanism be, uh, of the interaction between EMF and uh, antibiotics and uh, how, to, uh, how to let them and let the antibiotics and the IMF work together to uh, limit the uh, uh, biofilm, which, uh, what's the best way? Uh, and uh, we can use a higher power, so we, will, we, can, we, we can have uh, more heating modes that give us uh, more possibilities for the, uh, for the, um, for the treatment. After, uh, as I said, I want to, I want to thank my uh, mentor, uh, Dr. Chopra, and uh, uh, the collaborator, uh, Dr. Greenberg, and the lab members, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm happy to uh, take questions. So, Todd, do you have a question? In the ex vivo experiment, the washer experiment, mm -hmm. is it just me or did after the first time signature, the signal actually went up for the live? Uh, uh, sorry? In the, in the time sequence you have? Yeah, yeah. You have the first picture where it seems things seem to be kind of mostly neutral. And in the first picture, the live signal actually goes up. Yeah, that's like. a thing we, uh, we also noticed, uh, but we still need to figure out why. Mm, okay. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to ask you if you were quantifying this. Right now it looks pretty impressive in color. I'm concerned about is there a partial volume effect in the image and can you actually quantify the amount of kill that you've achieved? Uh, yeah, actually we are working on it now. Um, it's uh, some preliminary data and we uh, are working on, on that quantification. That can be quantified uh, in the software. So I have a question for you. So my question has to do with scalability. So when you do these, uh, when you build the AMF coil, right? Yeah. The amount of power you're going to be able to deliver is going to depend on the size of the coil. Yeah. It's going to be much harder. So how do you envision this being used in vivo if you've even thought about it uh, we so can, far? I think we can use um, temperature as a standard, like how, much, how the temperature will reach after like a few AMF exposure uh, to quantify how much uh, the heat will be deposited. Yeah, but I think we know from physics mm -hmm. that, that the amount of, of energy you can deposit, even on the skin, is going to depend on the, on, inversely on the diameter of the coil. Yeah. So you're going to have to increase the, the, probably the number of kilowatts you drive it with. And the yeah. question is, is this, is this is it, you think it's feasible to do this in humans going forward, uh, in vivo without, you know, like uh, externally apply this? Yeah, 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 yes, yeah. of course. Uh, uh, this is uh, just for the mechanism of the study, and we work on, uh, done some work uh, based on real knee implant uh, with much higher power. But we're working on that, also working on that. Good, it'll be great if it works. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Echi Erkan. She's going to tell us about the validation of inhomogeneous magnetization transfer imaging and preliminary results on multiple sclerosis. Her mentor is Elena Vinogradov. Thank you for the introduction. So myelin is a membranous structure which is wrapped around the axons of neurons, and its main function is to facilitate the electrical transmission throughout the axons. And when we look at the structure of myelin, it consists of a phospholipid bilayer and, uh, with embedded proteins, and there is myelin water in between these phospholipid bilayers. And the lipid tails of phospholipid bilayer uh, have dipolar couplings in between the hydrogen atoms. So as opposed to the normal nerve with intact myelin, 
In case of several diseases, including multiple sclerosis, the uh, myelin is damaged. And this causes clinical and cognitive dysfunction in patients and physical disabilities. So it will be quite advantageous to be able to have a quantitative method which can, which can show this damage and which can image the myelin. And this will really help with the early diagnosis as well as the treatment monitoring of uh, diseases such as multiple sclerosis. However, it's not very easy to image myelin due to the very short T2 relaxation time of myelin. So by the time that we uh, collect the data with the conventional MRI, we only get the signal from the tissue water, whereas the myelin signal completely decays. So therefore, alternative methods have been proposed throughout the years for myelin imaging. The oldest method for myelin imaging is my, that was proposed in 1993 is myelin water imaging. And this method uses the T2 relaxation properties of myelin water, which is the water trapped in between the myelin phospholipid bilayers. So this is a multi-T2 uh, type of method, and it attributes the short T2 components to the myelin water, and it can quantify the myelin with so-called myelin water fraction. So although it has been 25 years since the introduction of this method, this method still hasn't made it to clinic due to several reasons, and the main limitation of the method is the very long acquisition time as well as its model-based and complicated post-processing. Moreover, the information that we get with this method is not directly from myelin, but from the myelin water. Therefore, diffusion weight tensor imaging has been used widely in the clinical research studies of MS because although uh, this method is not really specific to myelin, it has been shown that radial diffusivity, which can be extracted from the diffusion tensor, is sensitive to reflect changes in demyelinated axons. However, uh, this, this RD can also reflect changes due to inflammation as well as due to edema. Therefore, this is not a very good measure of myelin. So the current situation uh, for myelin imaging is that the current methods are either specific to myelin, but they are not clinically feasible, or they are clinically feasible, like DTI, but they are not specific to myelin. So therefore, a novel method is needed, which is clinically feasible and specific to myelin. For this purpose, inhomogeneous magnetization transfer imaging has been recently <coughs> introduced in 2015, and this method is a novel enhanced magnetization transfer method, which is specific to myelin. The signal that we can get with this method originates from the dipolar couplings in between the phospholipid bilayer of myelin. And uh, it's quite easy to implement since this method is using a set of images and a linear combination of images with different uh, single or dual of resonance frequency saturation. So the purpose of our study was to conduct a comprehensive evaluation of this very novel method in the human brain in vivo and we wanted to validate this method through the comparisons with more established methods like myelin motor imaging and DTI that I just talked about. And we wanted to also investigate the potential of this method to characterize disease-related changes due to multiple sclerosis. For this purpose, we acquired the data on a 3T MRI scanner, and to validate IHMT, we acquired data from eight healthy volunteers with a really narrow age range to exclude the age effect. And we the data that we collected was myelin water imaging, diffusion tensor, and IHMT imaging data. And to evaluate IHMT in a demyelinating disease, we scanned three relapsing remitting MS patients with anatomical scans, such as T1, T2, and T2 flare images. And we also collected IHMT images from them. To apply IHMT, we implemented and optimized a 3D steady state IHMT pulse sequence which is a preparation module, and uh, which is followed by the acquisition of one line of case space. And this was repeated for each repetition time. In order to quantify the IHMT effect, we calculated the so-called IHMT ratio, 
And to be able to do that, we obtained one image with only positive off-resonance frequency saturation, and one image with only negative off-resonance frequency saturation, and one image with alternating positive and negative off-resonance frequency saturation, and one image with alternating negative and positive off-resonance frequency saturation. And by adding the single off-resonance frequency saturation images and subtracting the dual off-resonance frequency saturation images from them, and dividing this by a reference image, we calculated the so-called IHMT ratio. Here you see the IHMT ratio maps from the brain of one of the healthy volunteers, and you can already appreci appreciate the very good contrast between gray and white matter with this method, which is in line with the myelin content in gray and white matter. Moreover, when we qualitatively compared IHMT ratio with myelin water fraction, we observed that the regions with highest IHMT ratio, such as internal capsule, corresponded to the regions with the highest myelin water fraction. However, we didn't see such a similarity between the DTI maps and the IHMT ratio. Furthermore, we quantitatively compared IHMT with myelin water imaging and DTI, and here in each circle you see the mean IHMT ratio that we calculated from the automatically segmented white matter regions of interest, and we have observed a very high correlation between IHMT ratio and myelin water fraction. And this was followed with a moderate correlation between IHMT ratio and radial diffusivity, and we observed weak to no correlation between IHMT ratio and the other DTI metrics. So our results confirmed the myelin specificity of IHMT in the human brain in vivo. When we compared IHMT and uh, anatomical images from MS patients, you can see that uh, in the anatomical images, we can see MS lesions in terms of hyperintensities, and these are uh, qualitative images. However, we, from these lesions, we can, we can get quantitative results from the IHMT ratio maps. Moreover, from different MS lesions, we observe different levels of IHMT ratio, so this is also in line with the heterogeneity of the MS lesions. So this means that this method is promising to characterize the differences in different MS lesions. Then we quantitatively compared IHMT ratio values from MS lesions and from the normal appearing white matter from the MS patients, and we observed a significantly lower IHMT ratio from MS lesions compared to the normal appearing white matter. So the conclusions from our study is that IHMT is a very promising novel contrast method and uh, the images that can be, op uh, can be obtained within clinically feasible scan times, and our results confirm the myelin specificity of the IHMT in the human brain. And the preliminary results that we obtained from MS are very promising. The future directions will include applying IHMT on a larger cohort of MS patients, as well as spinal cord applications. And I would like to thank you and to thank all my collaborators and co-workers for their support of this study. Are there any questions for Echi? There's one in the back. Nice work. So what's the standard deviation or noise you're looking at in these images? And the other question is, what's the resolution? So can it be applied to peripheral nerves also? So the resolution in the brain is 2.5 by 2.5 by 5 millimeter cube. And uh, the standard, actually we uh, looked at the co coefficient of variation between all these methods. And it was uh, lowest in DTI, but um, it, it was really highest in myelin water fraction. So it's, it is acceptable about like 5% of coefficient of variation in this method. So that doesn't bleed through in the, in the signal itself. Sorry? That doesn't bleed into the signal itself. Like that's the problem with DTI when we do in the nerves. Like if you are looking at a FA value of going from 0.7 to 0.4 to be abnormal, the standard deviation itself is 0.2. So that's a big problem. Um, so I don't know how it works for, for MS work. Because if it's applicable in the peripheral nerves, so uh, you can actually biopsy those nerves and then yeah, actually, get the ground truth. Actually, right now we are trying to uh, to also apply this in the nerves, 
but so far we tried in uh, brachial plexus, and because of the motion and because this is the subtraction-based method, we have a lot of problems due to the, uh, yeah, we need to have better core registration, but we will also try in the arm, in the peripheral nerves as well. Yeah, sciatic nerve will be a good model if you want to try. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Neil. So just thank you for that. Uh, just wondering about any tests you've done for repeat, any tests you may have done for repeatability. So uh, we see that beautiful image. Yeah. We did the person 10 minutes apart. Would you come up with the so same variable result? Actually, we scanned the same person, uh, and there, were, there was one month in between the two scans, and we got like an R square of 90% uh, or above. So it, it has good repeatability in that sense. So I'm going to ask you to make a comment, I think, just to let people in the audience know. Um, I think it's worth uh, describing what you think the orientational dependence of this is. So uh, we also looked at the orientational dependence of this method because dipolar uh, couplings, they, they are known to be orientation dependent. So we looked at the DTI eigenvector and then we extracted the angle of each, uh, uh, each voxel in the, from the DTI. So the, we calculated the angle with respect to the main angle of the B0. And then we, co we correlated this to the IHMT ratio, and we saw a very high correlation between the orientation and the, um, and the or orientation of the fibers and the, the IHMT ratio. So we think that this method is orientation dependent. So good. Yeah, we need to. Thank you. So our, our uh, next speaker is Yu Zhuo Chen. Um, and the title of his talk is Improved Liver Segmentation and, and Volumetry with Spectral Detector CT and MADPLOT. Uh, his mentor is Julie Field, Julia Fielding. I believe you're a medical student, is that correct? correct. Yeah, okay, so we have to cut him a break because he's, he's just a, a medical student. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Linkinski. Um, so first, I'd like to thank all my fellow collaborators in the Spectral CT group for giving me the opportunity to work with them on this project. So just an introduction. Um, so accurate liver segmentation and volumetry are essential components for the preoperative imaging workup for liver transplantation. Currently, the most accurate technique is manual or hand segmentation, which is a very tedious and time-consuming process that involves drawing ROIs around every image of the liver across all slices. Um, automated liver segmentation methods have been developed and traditionally use Hounsfield unit attenuation, but it's very prone to errors due to the heterogeneity of Hounsfield unit measurements within any given slice. So therefore, there's a need for a liver segmentation tool that is both time-saving yet accurate enough for clinical use. Um, so, the technique that we propose um, is termed the mad plot. Oh, sorry, just give me one second. Yeah, um, the mad plot technique. Um, and what basically this is, is it takes advantage of a dual energy CT uh, technology, such as spectral CT, to separate um, X ray att attenuation of matter into its fund fundamental components, the photoelectric and the Compton scatter effects. So what this means that is every pixel on a spectral detector CT image can be separated, separated into these two characteristics and then plotted based on these values and on a 2D histogram termed a mad plot. Um, so this is kind of what a mad plot looks like. This is an illustration of the mad plot. Um, on the x-axis, you have the Compton, Compton effect. On the y-axis, the photoelectric effect. And this is where typical compounds that you find in clinical imaging would be located. Um, you know, on this, on this axis, so with lung and then, you know, contrast, such so iodine, calcium, and then soft tissue kind of in this area. So what we propose is that using this technique, this map plot technique that takes advantage of spectral detector CT, we can separate liver parenchyma from, adja from adjacent structures. And we hypothesize that our method will be superior to Hounsfield unit-based technique uh, techniques when they are assessed against the gold standard of manual segmentation. So our study design, um, so in this HIPAA compliant IRB approved retrospective study, um, we took images from a heterogeneous group of patients that were undergoing CT scans not evaluating the liver. 
um, across this span of time. Uh, these are our scan parameters. And we chose to exclude livers that were abnor uh, abnormal, um, overly abnormal. And from this, we were able to obtain 30 uh, livers randomly. We chose, we chose them randomly from the eligible crit criteria. Um, these 30 livers were segmented using three methods, manual hand segmentation as a gold standard, um, and the two experimental methods, the Hounsfield unit-based segmentation method and our experimental method uh, that we proposed, the MAD plot-based segmentation method. Um, so this is what the, uh, the MAD plot would look like um, in actuality. So um, this is kind of like the, where the lung and the air tissue would be. Here is where kind of the soft tissue, um, you know, characteristic values would be for this image right here. And uh, this is what, so, so what we have found is that this particular area here on the MAD plot, so this corresponds to this area here, actually corresponds to the liver. Um, and the way that we can take advantage of this fact is that the user can input um, a specific region of interest within the liver, so this is semi-automated, and then that will correspond to a particular set of Compton and photoelectric coefficients within this area of the MAD plot. And then what we can do is select this entire island of Compton and photoelectric uh, coefficients or uh, coefficient coordinates, and then use that to reverse map to the entire liver, and that produces an accurately segmented liver. Um, so we chose to um, assess this method against the Hounsfield-based method on two metrics: volumetric accuracy, as determined by bland altman plots and segmentation performance based on dye similarity coefficients. Um, so this is just an explanation of the dye similarity coefficient. There's the overlap between, um, between the two livers. So this is the results um, of our experiment. So, on the, so we have three images here, um, and it's the three different segmentation methods that we have used. So on the left here is hand, or manual segmentation. In the middle here, we have our Hounsfield unit base segmentation, which you can see is kind of speckly. Um, and this is due to the fact that a lot of pixels are excluded um, because there's uh, Hounsfield unit heterogeneity within this image. So a lot of, you know, a lot of liver that has Hounsfield units um, outside of the range that it's determined is going to be excluded. And concomitantly, as you can see, there's some spillover into adjacent structures, such as the IVC in this image. Shown in, shown in red because it's within the range of what's considered liver. And in some other slides, you know, there's significant spillover into spleen and abdominal wall as well. On the right here, we have our method, the MADPLOT segmentation method, um, which as you can see, very closely resembles the manual segmentation method. And in terms of more strict char uh, characteristics, volumetric accuracy, um, both the Hounsfield unit method and the MADPLOT method correlate well against, gold standard, uh, against our reference standard of hand segmentation. Um, with only one data point, one liver on each falling outside 95% limits of normal, although the Hounsfield unit uh, method tends to underestimate the true volume of the liver with a larger negative bias and has a larger spread, so it's kind of less specific than our method. But in terms of seg segmentation accuracy, uh, the MADPLOT segmentation method consistently outperforms the Hounsfield unit-based segmentation method across all 30 patients. So this is just to summarize our results. We have a significantly higher dice coefficient with our map plot method than the Hounsfield unit-based method. Um, so what, what we've been able to do is we've been able to develop a novel segmentation technique termed the map plot based segmentation technique using spectral de detector CT and this principle of material attenuation decomposition which separates each pixel into its photoelectric and Compton components. And what we've been able to show is that this method um, is superior than household unit-based methods in providing liver volumetry and segmentation when both are uh, compared against uh, the reference standard of hand segmentation. And although not directly assessed, the math plot method was rapid and significantly faster than hand segmentation, and uh, we propose that um, this could be a potential um, you know, clinical tool used to segment the liver. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions? There's a question, Ron? Um, Everyone hear the question? 
Yes? The effects of, Ryan asked about the effects of motion and other artifacts. Um, I don't believe that's something that we looked at exactly. There's so, another. yeah, I've, I've got a question. Uh, sure, Neil. Yeah. You chose to do this on normal livers. Yes. And so the question, uh, of course, is what happens in abnormal livers because we're rarely interested in the normal ones. So um, what is what are your thoughts and what are the group's thoughts on that, number one? Number two, are the differences that we see, we can say that it looks better, is it clinically significant to drive a management change or is it just a workflow issue? And I'm not minimizing workflow. It's very important. Yeah, so to answer your first question, I mean, I think if we're looking at transplanting livers uh, from a donor to a recipient, I think the donor liver is going to be normal because the, 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 the whole idea is that, you know, we clinically, we, the surgeon needs to know exactly how much liver is going to be transplanted to the recipient and then how much liver will be remaining in the donor because that's really essential to assess the feasibility of the surgery and the survival of both parties. So I think, you know, in terms of normal, I, th I think the majority of our donor deliveries are actually going to be normal. And to answer your second question, I'm sorry, what was your second question, question again? Um, let me think. <laughs> <laughs> how accurate does it have to be to d drive oh, that's a right. dis clinical decision? Thank yeah. you, Bob. Yeah, because so, I mean, if you, if you, if you look at the, the volumetric data, I mean, it seems like they both estimate the volumes pretty well. Um, but the segmentation performance is so much better. And I think there's a lot of, you know, there are a lot, there's a lot of work that can be done in the future, I think, to tone, like specifically, like explore our technique. Because right now, we're able to segment the liver very accurately. And there's some work that we've been doing where we're able to actually use our technique to separate hepatic lesions, segment hepatic lesions from the liver itself. So, well, I think, you know, the improvement is significant. Um, our technique has a lot of ability, you know, in the future to, to you know, there are a lot more clinical uses that we can do. So uh, just a comment, Neil. I mean, I mean we, th we think these livers are normal, but we're not able to do normals uh, under an IRB. These are people who've come in for some other reason. We looked at the livers. I mean, someone looked. I didn't look at them because you wouldn't rely on my reading of them to know anything. But they're within a range of not having much pathology in them. You know, one, one thought would be that if we, if we really wanted to get at this, uh, in an experimental model, we could do this in an animal model, excise the livers and do a weight displacement volume comparison, and then you'd have a, a pretty good gold standard to compare it to as opposed to the assumed gold standard. Just an idea. There's another question there, Dr. Ink. Dr. Ofsky, I just want to um, help him answer one of the questions that you asked. So. Basically, this, this is a pilot study where we pick uh, normal livers, and I, uh, we started that way because that's the lowest lying fruit, and we, we're starting to experiment with, uh, you know, gradually more abnormal livers. For example, we are starting to look at um, uh, livers containing hepatic tumors. Uh, we, we have good results, as uh, Yishal said, that we are able to actually separate out hepatic tumors from normal liver parenchyma, and the, the way we do that is be, the first layer, we just separate out the liver. And uh, on the second layer, we have a separate computation that separates out the different tissues um, into basically hep hepatic um, tumors versus normal liver parenchyma. Okay, thank you for the comment. Uh, I think we ought to give this medical student a round of applause for the wonderful work that he did. Our final speaker of this session is Josh Greer. He's going to, the title of his talk is Cable Blood Flow Distribution in Photan Circulation Comparison Between ASL Measured Pulmonary Perfusion and 4D Flow. And his mentor is Ananth Madaranthakam. Thank you for the introduction. The Fontan procedure is performed in children with congenital heart defects that result in only a single ventricle functioning. So this operation routes venous blood from the IVC and the SVC directly to the pulmonary arteries, bypassing the right heart. This resulting Fontan circulation is associated with increased development of pulmonary arteriovenous malformations, or AVMs, where abnormal connections are made between the arteries and the veins, rather than the blood reaching the capillaries to be oxygenated. 
This is thought to be caused by the possible uneven distribution of venous hepatic flow, uh, which can occur when the IVC and SVC are offset like this. So the IVC contains some currently unknown hepatic factor that when excluded from a lung uh, seems to be a risk factor for AVM development. Uh, so in this example, if the IVC flows towards the left lung, the right lung would be at increased risk. And this is supported by Fontan revisions to more evenly redistribute this flow, uh, resulting in the regression of these AVMs. So existing methods to evaluate the risk for AVM development uh, require invasive procedures and exposure to ionizing radiation. Uh, so the cable flow direction can be monitored with selective angiography requiring catheterization, and the resulting lung perfusion can be measured with perfusion scintigraphy. Uh, but a non-invasive MRI-based technique would be beneficial for these pediatric patients. So recently, 4D flow has been applied to non-invasively measure this uh, differential IVC flow. Um, but this scan time and post-processing can both be very time-consuming. And uh, this also doesn't provide us with a, a lung perfusion measurement. So the goal of this project was to measure that IVC flow direction as well as quantitative pulmonary perfusion using arterial spin labeling and we compare these measurements with 4D flow. So arterial spin labeling is a perfusion MRI technique that uses water in the blood as endogenous contrast. Uh, with this technique, we acquire a control image with the inflowing blood left at equilibrium and a label image where we invert the inflowing blood. So the difference between these images is proportional to their perfusion into our imaging plane. Since we're only imaging water in the blood, this technique does not require a contrast injection, and we can also use it to create quantitative perfusion maps uh, which would be beneficial for monitoring patients over time. So there are several different ASL techniques with uh, different approaches to inverting this inflowing blood, uh, but we applied these two specific techniques, FAIR and PCASL, in this project. Uh, so I'll explain what those are on the next slides. So FAIR is an ASL technique that has been established for lung perfusion imaging. Uh, it consists of saturation pulses and a labeling inversion pulse centered on our imaging plane a post-labeling delay to allow that labeled blood to perfuse the tissue, and then finally our acquisition. In our control image, we apply a selective inversion pulse, and in our label image, a non-selective inversion. And then after that post-labeling delay, we acquire our images in the same plane. And the difference between these images is proportional to the blood flow from this wider inversion region into our imaging plane. And we can subtract them and create a perfusion-weighted image like this. Uh, so we could use this technique to uh, measure pulmonary perfusion following a Fontan operation, um, but since this signal originates from just anywhere outside of our imaging plane, uh, we don't know whether it came from the SVC or the IVC. Uh, so there's another technique, PCASL, that we can use to specifically label an inflowing vessel. So using this train of RF pulses with this uh, selection gradient, we create this labeling plane that will invert blood flowing perpendicularly through the plane. And for our control sequence, we phase cycle the RF pulses for a net result of no inversion on the inflowing blood. So we've applied this technique in normal circulation uh, by labeling the IVC so that labeled blood will first mix in the right heart before splitting and going to the lungs through the pulmonary arteries. So in normal circulation, this can give an even distribution of uh, blood flow, uh, blood, labeled blood signal between the lungs, and we've uh, compared this with uh, fair perfusion. Um, but in Fontan circulation, applying the same labeling approach, we can get a direct measure of this differential IVC flow by looking at the resulting lung perfusion. So we've implemented these sequences on a 1.5T Philips Ingenia and have scanned 19 patients around 15 years old, and we also acquire a separate proton density weighted image for quantification. The uh, FAIR total perfusion image is acquired in a single breath hold, and that takes 18 seconds. And the PCASL IVC contribution is acquired with more signal averages, and we can acquire those in three and a half minutes. So we also acquire 4D flow to compare with those uh, differential flow measurements. Uh, this sequence is acquired with 24 sagittal slices across the junction of those major vessels here, and this takes about 15 minutes. And post-processing was performed in GT flow, and this can also easily take 15 to 30 minutes per subject. So here are a couple example subjects I have to show. This is fair perfusion showing total perfusion to this coronal slice and PCASL showing only the IVC contribution, in this case appearing to be evenly distributed between the lungs. Uh, we also see a labeling artifact below the diaphragm here caused by that labeling plane. 
With 4D flow, we can draw ROIs over the SVC and the IVC and generate these flow path lines uh, to visualize the flow distribution uh, from each of these vessels. So in this case, the blue IVC flow also appears to be evenly distributed between the lungs. So to quantify this, we can draw ROIs over the lungs in PCASL and just look at the ratio of the measured perfusion. And in 4D flow, we can count the particles arriving through the RPA and the LPA that originated from the IVC. So again, in this case, uh, both ASL and 4D flow agreed that the IVC flow was pretty evenly split between the lungs. In another case, the PCASL IVC contribution showed that the IVC flowed almost entirely to the right lung, and we see very little of that labeled blood arriving in the left lung. And 4D flow also agrees, showing the blue IVC flow going mainly through the RPA. And the quantification also shows uh, the agreement about the differential flow towards the right lung. So these are the results across all of our subjects. This is the percent of IVC flow towards the right lung measured with 4D flow and with ASL, uh, showing good agreement. Uh, with ASL, uh, the percent of IVC flow towards the right lung ranged from 28 to 71 percent and across all subjects. And with 4D flow, that range was 36 to 78 percent. Uh, so we do see a wide range of flow towards the left and the right lung. So it does vary from uh, evenly split at 50 percent. Bland-Altman analysis showed a relatively low bias of 4% between ASL and 4D flow. So we've demonstrated a non-invasive, non-contrast measurement of both pulmonary perfusion and those differential IVC flow measurements using arterial spin labeling. Uh, this technique, which poses no additional risk to the pediatric patients, has the potential to provide a longitudinal Fontan evaluation to, uh, to evaluate risk for AVM development. Future work on this project will include creating 3D perfusion maps to more accurately assess perfusion across the entire lung, and uh, this should also improve our measurement of that differential IVC flow as well. And we'd also like to correlate those differential flow measurements with AVM development in uh, future patients um, and see if our results agree with what has been previously published. Okay, I'd like to thank my lab mates, and I'll take any questions you have now. Any questions for Josh? Yeah, Julia. Spectacular. You know, the thing is, they're kids, though, right? Yeah. And you said that the imaging takes 20 minutes or so, and maybe the post processing, maybe it's probably very sensitive to artifact. Mm -hmm. So, this is a general anesthesia technique right now, probably. Actually, and since they were around 15 years old, we actually, uh, any okay. of these we didn't have to. We ha Since okay. then, we have scanned a few under anesthesia. Though. Yeah, okay. So like a teenager would be fine, but yeah. a younger kid, maybe that you're still doing post-operative assessment or something like that, right. maybe a little bit more of an issue. Great, thank you. <laughs> Cut him off. <laughs> that was really very nice work. And um, I think my, uh, in, in order to get your perspective on which technique might be more useful in the long run, um, the 4D flow has the advantage of laying out the surgical anatomy uh, that's causing that redirection of flow. And the, the surgeons at least at our institution, are really interested in that so they can plan how to revise the Fontan to reduce the flow. Can you comment on how your uh, surgical colleagues are interpreting that? Um, I don't know about any colleagues, but um, I, think the, I think the ASL acquisition could be used for maybe follow-ups and like maybe looking at like how a treatment is uh, affecting not treatment, I guess, a surgical revision a after the fact. You could look at how the uh, flow is redistributed um, if you wanted to look at perfusion as well. Um, and I assume the fair technique with the breath holds took a lot less time. Did you get similar numbers or did you see an effect of the breath holds on the perfusion 
to each lung. Well, so the fare only shows the total perfusion into the slice. It doesn't tell you anything about that, the IVC flow. Uh, so that's why we use the Picasso labeling. It does take less time. Yeah. Yes. Um, There's a question in the back there. <clears throat> Very nice work. Uh, I was wondering, uh, these scans are done in supine position, I'm assuming, and obviously we can't tell what's going on in the physiologic standing position, but do you have any sense of any variability with lateral, lateral the acuities, for example, right and left uh, positions? I'm sorry, variability in does, what? In the change of the flow to the right lung, does it change when you uh, have the patient on the right or left lateral acuities? You can go decubitus and then People have done this mm -hmm. with PSL, and they go on their side. Mm -hmm. and, the, and, the, and the question is, does the flow appear to change whether you're doing it on your right side or your left side? Right, I got those reversed, right side, left side. <laughs> that is a good question. Maybe we can try that <laughs> after it's, we It's actually yeah. been done in, in adults. OK. OK. Good. Well, thank you, Josh. So I have a couple of announcements to make. Um, first of all, there are light refreshments outside. Since we're at a state institution that has many rules that we can't disobey, you're not on pain of uh, punishment. We can't bring the food back into this uh, conference room, so please enjoy it outside. Um, the oral speakers for the first half can pick up their certificates on the, at the information desk out front. And there's going to be a group photo, so I'm going to invite all the oral speakers, the ones that have already spoken and the ones who are about to speak later, and uh, Dr. Rofsky, Dr. Grist, and myself and Dr. Morris, my partner in crime. We're going to follow Glenn Katz out to where the, he's our crack photographer, and he'll take a picture of us. And again, I'd like to ask you to thank me, uh, to join me in thanking both the presenters and the mentors who helped make all of these presentations as high quality as they were. Great. So we have five more oral presentations, and then we'll take a short break, and we have a great talk coming at 4. So don't leave the place at 4 o'clock. You will miss out something really good. So let's start with our first presentation, and I have the privilege of introducing Anish Narayanan, and his mentor is Dr. Avni Shabra, and the talk is Density Analysis of Spontaneous Extremity Fractures Using 3D Computed Tomography, a Case Control Study. Come and present to us. All right, thank you for the introduction. So the first thing I would want to address is, well, what is a spontaneous fracture? And basically, a spontaneous fracture is a fracture that occurs without some sort of clear external cause. The key thing to emphasize, though, is that spontaneous fractures and pathologic fractures aren't really the same thing. Pathologic fractures, there's usually some sort of secondary disease pathology or some underlying pre-existing lesion that's responsible for the, spontaneous fra for the fracture. In spontaneous fractures, there's no, no such clear etiology like that. So in that case, you might be wondering, well, what causes spontaneous fracture? And the most common cause is osteoporosis. And it's estimated that there are over 200 million people who have osteoporosis and that one in every three women and one every five men will eventually have a fragility fracture as a result of this osteoporosis. And hip fractures in particular are known to be del deleterious, having major morbidity and mortality. So what can clinicians do to assess the osteoporotic state of the bone? And currently, the imaging modality of choice, the gold standard, is the DEXA scan. And this gives us an x-ray showing the aerial density of the bone from which we can get a T-scores to see if the patient lies in the osteopenic or osteoporotic ranges. However, by nature of being a 2D projection, it's pretty limited. You can't really get the 3D geometry of the bone. Furthermore, especially in the older populations that we're interested in imaging, you are suspect to a lot of different calcification artifacts, aortic calcification, soft tissue calcification, that could raise the measured bone mineral density. Finally, the changes on DEXA are really slow to progress, so it's really hard to use it with repeated imaging to follow disease or treatment course. So what is the alternative? What can we do to address all of these shortcomings? Well, it turns out that CT imaging it's, well, it gives you 3D anatomic data. It's routinely available. There are CT scanners everywhere versus having a specialized equipment like DEXA would require. 
Uh, it's routinely obtained, so you could uh, chart easily um, a person's bone density. And in the literature, at least quantitative CT has been used and has established bone density thresholds that match the DEXA T-scores. Unfortunately, though, routine CT without those calibratory phantoms hasn't been as well studied in the use for studying osteoporotic bone. So that's what our project aims to do. We hypothesize that on routine CT, spontaneous fracture patients should have reduced bone density in comparison to appropriately matched controls. So how do exactly do we go about selecting the cases in the study? Well, we had 522 patients that we took from the Parkland PACs who had some fracture admission between 2013 and 2016. We didn't know exactly what the cause of the fracture was, so the first thing we did was we went through the case history in the EPIC chart, and we excluded any trauma, malignancy, um, any like renal pathology, or any history of prior hardware or surgery at the site of the fracture. This left us with about 163 spontaneous fracture cases, so you can see that like here. Once we had those 163 cases, we subdivided by anatomic location, which gave us, oh, Sorry, just scroll a little bit. Oh, very sensitive. Okay, it gave us 35 hip fracture cases from which we were able to find 24 spontaneous femoral fracture cases ultimately. So what about the controls though? Well, we compared them to patients who had KUBCT imaging done as part of a workup for kidney stones. And once we age and sex match those patients, we found that there was no significant differences between our case and control group in all these uh, different demographic parameters, age, sex, BMI. So okay, so now we had our cases and we had our controls. What's the next step? What kind of imaging work do we need to do? And this is where myself, as well as Anthony Kai, another medical student, came in. We drew these ROIs. These are kind of a little bit small to see here, but there's these little oh, there's these little red circles in the trabecular bone that we drew. And these are three centimeter circles that were drawn at the side of the fracture, proximal to the side of the fracture in the femoral head, and distal to the side of the fracture in the lesser trochanter. And these were drawn both on the side of the fracture as well as on the contralateral side. And for each of these ellipses, we recorded the mean Hounsfield units. And this, once again, just a reminder, is just the trabecular bone. We didn't sample any of the cortical bone in these three centimeter ROIs. So once this was done, we were able to form three different comparisons. We compare the case fracture side to the contralateral non-fracture side in the patients with a spontaneous fracture and found there were significant differences in the density observed at and distal to, but not proximal to the fracture site. Then we made measurements and observed between the case fracture and the control non-fracture and found there were significant differences proximal and distal to, but not at the fracture site. Finally, we did the same thing for case non-fracture and control non-fracture, and observed a similar pattern. Uh, significant differences proximal and distal, but not at the fracture site. I think this is a little bit more intuitive, though, in this box and whisker plot, which shows the results of the Hounsfield distribution. So you can see these blue bars here. They correspond to the mean Hounsfield unit density at this, on the fracture side. So this is proximal, at, and distal. We also have numbers for the contralateral side, proximal et and distal, as well as in the control patients. And you can see here, if you were looking at the fracture site, where you might think the bone's the weakest, and you were to measure Hounsfield unit density, you can see here the contralateral side and the, the side that's fractured, the side that's fra fractured actually has higher bone density. And this is likely due to trabecular bone compression as well as hemorrhage. And this higher bone density could almost be mistaken for the, the density of the normal control bone. So if you're once trying to document a bone insufficiency, perhaps sampling at the site of the fracture is not the ideal location. In fact, it might be smarter to sample proximally or distally, particularly in this case for the femoral fractures proximally where we expect the bone to be densest, i.e. in the femoral head. And actually, we did a little bit of some statistics and calculated that in the femoral head, for every 50 Hounsfield unit decrease that was observed in the bone density, the risk of fracture, the odds ratio, increased by 74.4%. So this is just to show the interclass correlation coefficients between mine and Anthony's reads, and it shows pretty good agreement. Uh, limitations of this project. Um, the controls came from patients who had kidney stones or being worked up for kidney stones, so they might not represent the general healthy population. Another limitation was that six patients in the study had prior allegrinate usage, 
However, the fractures weren't characteristic of a bisphosphonate use fracture, as those fractures would be um, distal to the lesser trochanter, <coughs> while all of our fractures were above it. So conclusions, basically there's little merit in measuring at the side of fracture to calculate or observe the reduced bone density and bone insufficiency. It's better to measure somewhere else, proximal or distal to that site. Future work, um, we have 88 knee subset of fractures that we are processing. We've also done uh, muscle and fat analyses for our femoral fractures that we're currently doing the statistics on. We could also correlate our findings with um, clinical measures like a timed up and go test as well as DEXA imaging. And I would just like to take a moment to, take, to thank my mentor, Dr. Chubba, for allowing me to work in his lab under his guidance. And he has a lot of great work going on in his um, group, and he always is willing to take on medical students. I'd also like to thank the second reader on the project, uh, Anthony Kai, as well as the MSTAR program for providing me the opportunity and the summer stipend to do this research. These are my references. Um, does anyone have any questions? First off, I want to thank you for another medical student working with our department doing research. We are very grateful to have you participating with us in working. And that's just another round of applause for a medical student doing a great job. Question in the back, Dr. Oz. How do your Hollinsville cut, point? cut points compare with those that have been established from opportunistic CT? say from colonography where uh, the spine has been looked at? So yeah, I did see like something in the literature just like looking at the vertebral spine doing similar things. I think I haven't done an, exp an explicit comparison with those findings, but it does seem similar in the conclusions that we got. Uh, let's see, I don't know. Slide is going. More questions? Okay. No more questions? Thank you very much, okay. Nish. We are very appreciative. And thank you to Dr. Chabra and Dr. Fielding for mentoring our medical students, too. We really appreciate your work in that. So, so our next presenter will be Shuzang, and her mentor is Elena Vinogradov. And the title of her talk is Cess Dixon for Human Breast Lesion Characterization at 3 Tesla, a Preliminary Study. Thank you. Come present to us. Thank you for your introduction, and good afternoon, everyone. So um, mammography is widely used for breast cancer screening. However, it has its own limitations. So recently, MRI is being increasingly used in breast cancer imaging as a supplementary for mammography, both as a screening tool for younger women at higher risk uh, of developing breast cancer and as a problem-solving tool. DCE MRI becomes an indispensable part of the imaging protocol because of its overall high sensitivity. However, it suffers from suboptimum specificity. In addition, the gadolinium-based contrast agent may not suitable for patients with impaired renal function. Because of these limitations, other contrast-free uh, methods such as MR spectroscopy and diffusion-weighted imaging has been explored for breast cancer imaging either alone or combined with DCE MRI. Another potential uh, method for breast cancer imaging is chemical exchange saturation transfer or CEST imaging. CEST is a novel method for proton MRI. It can provide uh, molecular level information which reflect the biocomposition of tissues. Hence, we believe by incorporating the CEST imaging into the imaging protocol may lead to technology with improved specificity and prediction value. So in the, in the next two slides, I'd like to briefly introduce what CEST is and how we perform CEST imaging. As you can see down here, there are two uh, proton pools. One of the pools is water pool. Water is the most abundant molecules in tissues, so it is MRI visible. The other pool, solute pool, it can be amide, amine, or hydroxyl groups in the protein side chains or small molecules. The solute pool is usually in the minimal range, hence it is MRI invisible due to low concentration. However, if we apply an RF pulse on resonance with the solute pool, the saturated protons in the solute pool can exchange with the protons in the water pool, hence brings down, brings down the water signal. 
By doing so, we, uh, these MRI invisible solid pool can be indirectly detected by the uh, analyzing the water signal decrease. So in, practi in practice, we apply the RF pulses at multiple frequencies and measure the subsequent water signal. This is the so-called Z-spectrum. And based on the Z-spectrum, we can calculate the SESI effect, the so-called MTR asymmetry. It is calculated by subtracting the left side from the right side. A big imaging challenge for a successful breast cell imaging is the presence of large fat content. Fat can lead to lipid artifacts and can confound the cesta contrast. So as you can see in the Z-spectrum, the water is in the middle and the solute pools are on the left and the fat is on the right. So when we calculate the MTR and symmetry, the MTR and symmetry with fat is actually lower than the true MTR and symmetry without fat. To, re to remove the fat influence, the sesta dixon method is proposed to obtain pure water sesta images in our study. So the imaging sequence is shown down here. The, the sesta saturation is followed by a three-point multi-echo dixon acquisition. Compared with other method, uh, fat suppression methods such as stir and spear, dixon method is insensitive to Bezerian homogeneity. It does not interfere with the saturation pulse train and will not increase in SAR. Another advantage of using Dixon method is that it can provide a B0 map by itself. Hence, there is no need for a separate B0 mapping sequence. This saves us uh, scan time. So the goal of our study is to examine the application of cest dixon to breast malignancy and 3T to compare the cest signals of normal breast tissues with that of benign and malignancy in different frequency ranges and to investigate the correlation of cest signals with breast cancer biomarkers, including estrogen receptor ER and KI67. So these are the representative image cest images uh, without Dixon and with Dixon. The Z-spectrum and MTR and symmetry are averaged in the fibroglandular tissue ROIs in both breasts. So a fat dip can be clearly seen in the uh, Z-spectrum without the Dixon, and it results in a negative MTR and symmetry. And in the water-only Z-spectrum and MTR and symmetry, the fat influence has been successfully removed. So the cest dixon sequence has been applied to five healthy volunteers and 10 patients prior to biopsy and later confirmed eight malignancies and two benigns. The 10 patients were stratified into three groups, the malignant ER negative invasive ductal carcinoma group, the uh, malignant ER positive IDC group, and the benign, and the benign group. Compared with the ER positive group, <coughs> the ER negative is more aggressive and more likely to recur and three of the patients were excluded from the study because of the tumor type, size, and motion. And all the images were acquired at 3T Philips human scanner. So these are the representative images of a healthy volunteer, a ER positive IDC patient, and an ER negative IDC patient. So we can see for the IDC, ER negative IDC patient, it has, cest, has higher cest effect compared with the ER positive and the healthy volunteer. However, for the ER positive patient, it has similar cest effect compared with the healthy volunteer. The figure here summarizes the cest effect for the four groups. So for the all three frequency ranges, we can see the ER negative group has higher cest effect than the ER positive, benign, and normal groups. But for the ER positive and benign groups, they tend to have a similar SESI effect to the normal group. And of the three frequency ranges, the hydroxyl and amine ranges has higher SESI effect in the, ER in the ER negative group. But the hydroxyl range has lar larger difference between the ER negative group and the other, and the, and the other groups. We also correlate the SESTA signal with the KI67 level in the IDC patient. KI67 is a marker of proliferation. The higher the KI67 level, the more aggressive the cancer. So in, as we can see in the figure down here, the MTR asymmetry in all three frequency ranges increases as the KI67 level increase, but the hydroxyl range has the best fit. To conclude, the cest dixon sequence is robust. Water fat decomposition leads to homogeneous fat removal.
vector-only images. In the preliminary small group study, the ER-negative malignant tissues display higher cest signals in all three frequency ranges compared with the ER-positive, benign, and normal tissues. Promising preliminary results show that the hydroxyl cest signal are much higher in the ER-negative than the ER-positive tissues and correlate well with the KI67 level, this indicating that the cest signal may differentiate between more invasive and less invasive breast cancer. Uh, at last, I'd like to thank, uh, thank my mentor and everyone in, the, in our big group, research group, and thank you all. Thank you very much. <laughs> questions. We have time for questions. Yes. I was wondering, uh, uh, very good presentation, by the way. I was wondering, what type of coil do you have to use for this, and how do you accommodate for different uh, breast pathology or breast uh, uh, sizes and shapes? Uh, so right now we are using the 16-channel uh, uh, breast coil for both breasts. Uh, but right now uh, we scan for 10 patients, but uh, except for the two uh, benign group, uh, benign cases, the other uh, eight are uh, seven of them are mainly in invasive ductal carcinoma, and the one is invasive in uh, mucinous carcinoma. And for the other, and for the Breast shapes, I think it, um, we didn't consider for that right now. Well, that's that's a, a very exciting work, uh, potentially uh, in this small population, if it works out for larger populations. Do you have a hypothesis for why the CES signal is different for the ER positive versus ER negative patients? So currently, we think because like uh, uh, ER negative group is more uh, malignant, so that's why it may it, it may has like a more um, kind of like a such as kind of a molecules which is related to this kind of aggressiveness. So these are uh, up regulated because of these are more aggressive tumors, and we see these up regulated molecules may relate it to the aggressiveness. So it might actually be the uh, intracellular, you know, proteins, uh, amides, all, all those are at a higher concentration that, that might be upregulated and then that transfers a cest signal yeah. or? Yeah, I think yeah. so. Like for w here, we look at three different ranges. Uh -huh. So one of them is looking at the amide range that may uh, relate it to the proteins, but we also look at the amine and hydroxyl and range, hydro. which may relate it to certain kind of like uh, molecules, for example, as choline or phosphocholine, mm -hmm. such things, which was related to breast cancer. Mm -hmm. Shoot, that was great. Um, what, what kind of information do we have about repeatability with this test? Uh, so currently we are, um, because right now we are not um, looking at the uh, reprodu reproducibility, but that's wha what we are going to do in the next step. So in the next step, we are also going to optimize our sequence using longer saturation time as well. So looking at the productivity and stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Xu. Well, our next speaker is very familiar to this podium and research presentations. And it's my privilege to introduce you, Dr. Ali Parasti. His mentor is Takeshi Yoku. And Ali's talk is Intermethod Re Reproducibility of Bioexponential R2 Magnetic Resonance Relaxometry for Estimation of Liver Iron Concentration. And I said that all in one breath. <laughs> Take over. Thank you, Dr. Morris. Uh, <clears throat> Good afternoon. I have nothing to disclose. Our 2 MRI estimation of liver iron concentration is a very good surrogate for total body iron, uh, and uh, it guides the management of patients who have known or are at risk for iron overload. It's based on the principle that liver that is affected by iron overload loses signal on prolonged uh, TEs compared to normal liver, and if somebody plots that signal against echo time, they can actually do a um, curve fit, and they can do a um, they can solve for R2. And if you solve for R2 and you get that for the liver, the average shows that it was that correlates with liver uh, uh, iron concentration, and that's the basis for what is Ferry Scan R2 Relaxometry. It's a commercial product where you get spinnacle images at six, nine, 12, 15, and 18 milliseconds. Put an ROI in the liver, and then it goes through this very complex post processing that is done by Resonance Health. It's proprietary. It's very complex. 
at the end, the images are filtered. Then those RIs are uh, plotted against time. And then what they do is a bi-exponential fitting to the curve, which has a fast component by the red brackets and a slow component by the blue brackets. And then there is a weighted average to get the R2. Then they generate a pixel by pixel R2 map. And after that, that correlates with Lebrun concentration. And this uh, complex uh, procedure is pretty much the only FDA-approved R2 relaxometry for Lebrun concentration. However, what it lacks is independent validation by uh, a third uh, source. And nobody has been able to do this uh, because it's so complex and it's proprietary until recently, where the Iron Man at our institution, with some uh, funding from the uh, Stark Industries, was actually able to reverse engineer this whole process. And uh, thus, the purpose of this was to investigate the intermethod reproducibility of R2MRI in liver iron concentration estimation in patients who have either known or suspected liver iron overload. Now, this was a retrospective analysis of the available imaging data. We included all patients who had known or suspected iron overload that had undergone a fairy scan protocol MRI, we acquired all the images on one of the 1.5 Tesla MR scanners at our institution, and all the images were obtained per the fairy scan protocol. Now, all images, the spinnacle images that we obtained, they went off-site to Resonant Health for uh, proprietary, an proprietary analysis. They did a simulated anneal and curve fitting. That's what they do. And they generated an R2 map, and they gave us a proprietary R2. We took that report, same slice. We tried to replicate the same ROI as much as we could, and we did our own non-proprietary analysis and image post-processing. Then after that, we did one thing, a uh, very similar simulated annealing curve fitting, as much as we could replicate it, generated an SAR2 map. Then we also did a good old fashioned least squares uh, curve fitting to get another R2 map. And then at the end, it we also did a dictionary search curve fitting. And you might ask, well, what is this dictionary search curve fitting? If you imagine, it is difficult to fit a curve um, within these five data points, especially if you're trying to do a bioexponential curve fit. If you normalize the signal, this has to fit within this equation. It has two co one coefficient of p in front of each component. It has an R2 fast component and an R2 slow component. The trick is to solve that. If the signal is normalized, all those five yellow lines are going to represent a unit vector with a length of one. Then the trick is to find one of these curves that actually fits these five dots best. And each of these curves rep is represented by five uh, signals, so S1, S2, through S5. And each of these in itself is a unit vector. So it's a needle in a haystack problem now. And the easiest way to match the yellow vector to one of these white vectors is to do simply a dot product. So you simply do a dot product since the length is one. The one with the smallest theta actually matches. That would be the red arrow in the middle. You go back and look. That's the red curve to the left. You have your best fit. In theory, it should work. How do you feed this to a computer? Well, you tell a computer, I have a bunch of parameters, a P and an R2S and an R2F. You generate a matrix of how many ever variables that you would like with different intervals. Same thing with different echo times. And you have it do a dot product with the observed echoes that you got from the patient. That gives you a matrix of different numbers, the maximum. You can have the computer search for it, and that is the fit max, the largest number in there. You go back and see which parameters give you the maximum fit, and you have your R2S, P, and R2F. The weighted average gives you the r 2 your R2 map that way. So we assessed the reproducibility using linearity um, and uh, uh, bias. The linearity was assessed by linear regression analysis, and the absolute agreement was with interclass coefficient and blunt almond analysis. We included all 40 MRIs that we had from 38 subjects. Two subjects had uh, two MRIs each. And the etiology of iron overload was pretty diverse from primary hemochromatosis to thalassemia, hyperferritinemia of unknown etiology, sickle cell, or autoimmune hemolytic anemia. These are, this is an example of the proprietary R2 by Ferry scan, R2 maps by Ferry scan. On the top, no significant iron overload. To the bottom, that patient has severe iron overload. I have the R2s and liver iron concentrations listed. Just for comparison, I have the R2 maps generated by us to the right of the dotted line. And the looks of the maps look fairly similar. If you compare the R2s across the board, they are also very similar, about 35 to 38 on the top row, about 110 to 118 in the middle, and 270 to 80 um, at the bottom. How does this look across the population? Well, if we, do a, if we plot the fairy scan R2 against the, let's say, simulated annealing R2 in a, in a logarithmic um, scale, uh, the linear fit looks nice. The, uh, intercept is near zero, the slope is near one, 
and it has a very good um, intercost coefficient and a good linear fit, 0.97 R squared. You can actually see a very similar thing when you look at the least squares R2 and also the dictionary search R2. They look near identical. If we look for a bias, uh, we did a binomial analysis. We have the uh, difference in percent on the y-axis, the average on the x-axis, and the, there is no significant bias. Uh, average is 0.18% uh, with a p-value of 0.3. I'm sorry, the fonts are small. And the limits of agreement are about 7%. If you do the same thing with the least scores and the dictionary search, again, it's about 7 to 9%. That's where it is. And that's within what the ferry scan, inter-scanner variability has been reported. It's about 9 to 10% for those guys. So in conclusion, um, we were able to observe excellent intermittent reproducibility of R2 MRI for liver iron concentration. This was the first successful replication of ferry scan results, and we did that by following the published general strategy by Sam Peter and Clark. This was despite the differences in code development, and it was seen across a wide range of liver iron concentrations and we believe it speaks to the robustness of their general approach. Um, there are all limitations to this study. The sample size is small, the study is retrospective, and of course we have to take into account the differences in implementation of the various scan components. We just follow the general principles that they have described. Um, the also thing to consider is, is there ROI co-localization variability from what we placed compared to what they placed? Is there intra-subject reproducibility? If you use a different slice for the same subject, is there gonna be a difference? That's one thing that we're currently investigating. And also, inter-observable reproducibility. If I do the ROIs versus the Ironman doing the ROIs, is there gonna be a difference or third person? So we're working on that. I'd like to acknowledge uh, my mentors and a great team we're working with, also our excellent colleagues at the University of Wisconsin, Dr. Scott Reeder, Dr. Hernando, and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Dr. Lenkinski. So what's the rationale for bi-exponential decay? Um, as opposed to a mono-exponential decay? Yeah, I mean that, that, Why we do a bi-exponential decay? Yeah, now what's, is there a physical rationale for thinking that it should be bi-exponential versus mono? I mean, it probably is bi-exponential, but, but depending on what the signal to noise is and, and mm -hmm. whatever, you sure. might not be able to tell the difference. And one of the problems is at the end of the day, they give you a weighted average of the two R2s. Okay, and you could get lost in the shuffle by doing that. Yeah. So I, it just would be interesting to know if they, if anybody provides a rationale for doing bi-exponential. So the rationale kidding. that they provide, um, uh, the, the rationale that they provide. So if, if the, the paper that by Sam Pierre and Clark, when they do a bi-exponential fit, they actually see a much better correlation with um, the um, with higher liver ion concentrations. As you go to higher liver ion concentration, when you do a mono-exponential fit, the whole thing falls apart. The other thing is when you have a, ver uh, if you have a, when you have a liver that is very high in iron, you have a very rapid loss of signal. And at that point, you're doing a mono-exponential fit, and we're trying to, we try to do a mono-exponential fit, and we actually were able to do that at 1.5, and there is bias. And as you get to the higher B values, it, that's, it, it just doesn't correlate that well. So that is the rationale at this point. It's pretty much observed as opposed to other than that why. Takeshi. Um, the bioexponential nature of the R2 decay um, has not been clearly elucidated, but the computer simulation uh, suggests that the, it's due to uh, two uh, spe different species of iron-containing particles, um, ferritin and hemocytorin. They differ in the size and the magnetic effect, uh, as well as the, the spatial distribution. One more quick question. Ali, thank you very much. So our next presentation is by Dr. Ryan Fisicaro, and I'm pleased to introduce Ryan. He's one of our two five-year clinical scientist research track trainees. Raishu Saini is the other. Raishu has a wonderful poster out, if you didn't see it in the ex, ex, uh, educational exhibits. And uh, so, Ryan, we're very pleased to introduce you. He is mentored by Dr. Joe Malgen, and the title of his talk is Head Impact Exposure and Diffusion Tensor and Kurtosis in the Cerebral Peduncle After a Season of High School Football. Ryan, come speak to us. Thank you, Dr. Morris. Yeah, so there are no disclosures. And so the purpose of the study was to determine the, the relationship between changes in DTI and DKI metrics in the cerebral feduncle and cumulative head impact exposure 
after a season of high school football in the absence of clinically diagnosed concussion. And with uh, diffusion tensor imaging, we're making use of two B values in multiple uh, directions to model the movement of water. And with that, we can determine the directionality of that movement with the fractional anisotropy and the magnitude of that movement with the mean, axial, and radial diffusivities. Additionally, we also looked at the NADI tissue model uh, metrics, which model the movement of water both in, um, with considerations of an isotropic constraint and also restricted um, diffusion constraints. And with that, we're able to determine the contribution to the water signal by the CSF with the isotropic volume fraction, as well as the water signal coming from within neurites and the orientation of the neurites with the intracellular volume fraction and the orientation dispersion index. However, because the movement of water and its effect on the MRI signal is not linear with time, we also looked at diffusion kurtosis imaging metrics, as this makes use of an additional B value. And what kurtosis allows us to do is determine the difference between the distribution of water um, displacement versus that of a completely free and Gaussian system. And with that, we can determine the mean, axial, and radial kurtosis, as well as extend that with the white matter modeling metrics, which work with the assumptions of axons being unidirectional and the intraaxonal and extraaxonal spaces being independent and non-interchanging. So with those, we can look at the axonal water fraction, the intraaxonal diffusion, the extraaxonal axial diffusion, and radial diffusion, as well as the tortuosity, which is a ratio between those two. And so for some of the background for this project includes previous work um, in our lab that has shown that the accumulation of subconcussive head impacts increases the number of ab abnormal voxels in the brain with regards to many of these DTI and DKI metrics, as well as previous work that has shown that traumatic brain injury in the pediatric population causes both acute and chronic changes in fractional anisotropy values within the cerebral peduncle. So for our study, we looked at 39 male American high school football players between the ages of 14 and 18 with no significant past medical history and no history of concussion within one year of the start of the season. All of the players underwent preseason and postseason MRI. They were instrumented with the head impact telemetry system and an athletic trainer was available at all practices and games to help identify concussion. So the HITS hardware, as uh, seen here, is a configuration of six spring-mounted accelerometers, which are able to record the linear and rotational accelerations associated with the head impact. And what this allows us to do is quantify the head impact exposure over the course of a season with a metric called the risk-weighted cumulative exposure, which is the risk of a concussion with a head impact given its linear and rotational acceleration. So over the course of the season, given the number of impacts and the severity of those impacts, we can sum up those risks and derive a single number based off of the linear acceleration risk as well as the rot rotational acceleration risk. And thirdly, the combined probability risk, which takes into account both the linear and rotational accelerations. For our image processing, we used the T118 images to normalize to MNI space and segmented with VBM8. We used the DTI, TK, Amico, and DKE software packages on the diffuted, diffusion weighted images to generate the DTI and DKI metric values. We used the JHU Atlas to delineate the cerebral peduncle white matter region of interest. And for our statistics, we did the postseason minus the preseason values versus RWE with age, BMI, and time between scans as regressors. And for the results of the DTI analysis, while there are no significant relationships with the anisotropy or diffusivity, the overall trends are that of increasing anisotropy and decreases in the diffusivity. When looking at the NADI metrics, we saw significant increases in the intracellular volume fraction with increasing RWE, CP, and linear, and a near significant increase with RWE rotational as well. When looking at the DKI linear regression analysis, we saw significant increases in the mean kurtosis with increasing RWE, CP, and a near significant increase with the RWE linear as well. 
And while not um, significant, we did see trends of increasing axial and radial kurtosis as well. And lastly, for the white matter modeling metrics, while there are no significant uh, relationships seen, there were overall trends of increases in the axonal water fraction, as well as increases in both the axial and radial extra axonal um, diffusion values. So taken together, these results that would indicate that potentially what may be occurring in the cerebral peduncle with the accumulation of subconcussive head impacts is that there is an injury to the axons. And with this injury, there's morphological changes, specifically swelling, but potentially other changes such as beating as well. There does not appear to be demyelination, and the changes that um, may be occurring seem to be more in the intracellular versus the extracellular um, spaces. And while the permanence of these changes um, is not known, the potential, potential significance for this lies in that the cerebral peduncle contains multiple fiber tracts, such as the corticopontine, cortical bulbar, and cortical spinal tracts, as well as serving as the location of, this, of the substantia nigra, which thus has implications for disorders such as Parkinson's and chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And with that, here are the acknowledgments that we would like to make. Any questions? Thank you very much. <laughs> there must be questions. Yes, Dr. Chalmer. Yeah, so it seems like with, at least on the sub-concussive level, that there's probably um, swelling going on. So the water movement is more within the axons and more directional, and thus like the diffusion in the other directions is uh, decreasing uh, because of that. So FA in the setting of acute trauma is, can be confusing in that in chronic trauma, the FA values go down, but in the acute setting, it's reported that the FA values can go up or go down. It depends on how long after the trauma has been seen. And inside uh, this particular study, since these are pre and post season, we don't exactly know how long it's been, you know, since whatever event uh, contributed to what, what had occurred. But in terms of this relationship with FA, it doesn't always go down. No, there's no hemorrhage in these. I mean, we have SWI images and there's no evidence of hemorrhage. So I was interested in the dispersion of values at the low RWE. And yeah. does, are you, do you take that to mean that some people are more susceptible? So I would um, take that to mean that with the lower level of head impact exposure, there, seem, yeah, there seems to be a greater variability in what happens with them. But as the head impact exposures increase, it seems like those um, subjects had less variability. So on the lower end, there might be a lot of um, other factors going on, um, such as just pre previous exposure with other sports they may be playing, or there might be genetic factors as well that we're unable to account for um, in this. Okay. So, so I have two questions. So <clears throat> did, you do any, did you do any kind of neurocognitive testing of these people pre and post? Yeah, so we do have um, neurocognitive testing for them. And what happens? And well, we're looking into that now to see if there's any correlation, like with any changes in that with the head impact exposure. So nothing definitive as of yet. Okay, and the other, I just have a comment. So there's been sort of years and years and years ago, there was this uh, hypothesis called cyto cytoplastic streaming, where there was active transport of water along axons. Are you familiar with that? I am not, no. So that would, you know, that's, that's an ATP-dependent process, and at least in animals, it's been shown to be inhibited if you inhibit a ATP syn synthesis. So, so the water diffusion along the axon could be a lot faster than you would do from passive diffusion. And depending on how you injure it, you could get almost any answer you wanted to. So the question is what's actually, you know, trying to relate this back to some mechanistic physiological model is probably really hard. So, um, 
And you probably need very, very precise data. And I don't know how precise these data are. One more. Do we have another question? Oh, Dr. Morofsky. So thank you for the presentation. I'm not a mathematician. So I get a little alarmed when I see p-values that are statistically significant in a linear regression with an r-squared of 0.1. Can you explain mm -hmm. that? Yeah, so at least for what we did, we modeled the changes in those <coughs> metrics with uh, the regressors. And then we took the residuals and then plotted the um, RWE um, versus those. And so um, those graphs are showing that, yeah, the amount of head impact exposure that they're getting is accounting for, yeah, about 10% uh, or so change that we're seeing um, in the players. So yeah, obviously not super robust. I could be, it was like 0.8 or something like that, but. Yeah, so we can also look at whether like whether they're more logarithmic or quadratic um, in their change. It just so happened that um, with this data, it seems to be linear is probably the best fit. Although there's some other projects going on in our labs that show that sometimes the quadratic functions, like there's a certain threshold beyond which the changes are different. Thank you for that important work. I always think the subtitle should be Making Little League Baseball Great Again, right? Or Mamas Don't Let Your Babies Grow Up to Be Running Backs, right? Thank you very much, Ryan. <laughs> so for our final talk, we have Yi Ying, and he also is mentored by Takeshi Yoku. And the title of Yi's talk is A Simple Template Matching Method for Liver Proton Density Fat Fractionation Determination by Multi-Echo Gradient Echo MR Imaging. Come and talk to us, Yi. Thanks for the introduction. And I'm not going to repeat my title. It's kind of long. So proton density fat fraction, or PDFF, is a standardized MR metric of liver fat content. Its precision and accuracy has been validated against MR spectroscopy and biopsy, and it's a widely accepted uh, imaging biomarker for fatty liver disease. Now, to reconstruct a PDFF map is actually not a trivial matter. There's a lot of math involved, but you can see that um, the MR uh, signal of a GRE image actually um, changes um, due to the interactions between protons from fat and water, and it has this form uh, which includes a sinusoidal component as well as a, an exponential decay component. And it's been described by this really complicated equation. And you can see that it's dependent on PDFF, basically proton density fat fraction as well as T2 star. So traditionally, um, the way we generate PDFF mapping uh, is to first acquire multi-echo uh, sequence and uh, uh, multi-echo so that we can sample uh, the curve at multiple different time points, i.e. Uh, echo times, and then we perform a, um, a nonlinear least square fit curve, uh, curve fitting algorithm to generate the PDFF map. And then we can drop an ROI on the PDFF map uh, that results the, uh, in an average value that you can report as the average um, uh, liver fat fraction. Despite its utility, PDFF mapping is not widely available to everyone, and primarily because um, uh, community radiologists out there practicing probably don't have the technical knowledge to write their own reconstruction algorithms. Um, and also, um, they can turn to um, uh, vendors who have streamlined um, um, pulse sequence and products, or outsource their, their processing to a uh, data processing company outside, uh, but both options are actually costly. Hence, we, uh, uh, we pro uh, propose an alternative solution, a per ROI PDFF calculator. So this solution um, involves two components. One is a radiologist to draw an ROI on the GRE images itself, record it, and, um, um, and, and, and use it on an online calculator to generate the PDFF. And a decision, um, uh, a, um, design decision that we made is we made use of this new technique called template matching, 
you'll see that it's very, f um, you, you, you'll find it very familiar because it's the same technique that uh, Ali Praste has presented. He called it dictionary search, I call it template matching. So um, how does this work? So basically we use a parameter grid of uh, physiologically plausible uh, values of PDFF and R2 star and we generate uh, a bunch of signal templates. Um, basically each template um, uh, telling you how the MR signal is gonna behave across different TEs. Now to use the dictionary, um, you'll first um, uh, record all the ROI readout values into an ROI vector and then we calculate the dot product of um, each template, between each template within the dictionary and the ROI vector. And because the dot product is essentially the uh, metric of goodness of fit, you can find uh, one that has the maximum value and then just find out uh, which uh, uh, fit parameters it corresponds to, i.e. the PDFF and R2 star that you're looking for. So if all that, those steps sounded really complicated, basically um, this method is really analogous to a big lookup table. Um, it's, it also borrows concepts from uh, computer science, a design concept called dynamic programming. Um, basically, when you find yourself anticipating that you have to calculate the same calculation over and over again, it's actually wise to just pre-calculate all the results, save it into memory, so that you then don't have to perform the same calculation again. So in order to validate the accuracy of the template matching method uh, for liver PDFF, we conduct a clinical study to compare it to a standard nonlinear curve fitting method. This is a retrospective study including 51 patients and uh, 91 MRI exams, um, 91 because they, re they each receive um, uh, an exam before and after treatment um, with the scan parameters as shown. Um, and for the data analysis, we draw ROIs on a representative part of the liver, and PDFF is calculated by one using our template matching technique as well as standard curve fitting. Uh, for statistics, uh, we analyze um, using linear regression and bland Altman analysis to compare between the two methods. So these are, these are my results. Uh, basically, um, uh, you, can, you can see that linear regression analysis demonstrates exquisite linearity between the two methods uh, with a correlation coefficient really close to one, and you can see that there's very little deviation from the diagonal line. Similarly, um, the Alt bland altman analysis demonstrates the PDFF generated by template matching technique falls between 0.25% of uh, the PDFF that was generated by the curve fitting technique. So I've been talking about an online calculator. So finally, I'll let you guys have a glimpse of what the final product looks like. This, is, uh, this online calculator is available on the URL www.rtsfit.net slash tmatch. And you can log in using the username UTSW and the password is research day. So to use this online calculator, first you have to fill in the appropriate technical parameters of the MRI scan which will allow the web calculator to pull the appropriate library. And thereafter, you will record, copy and paste the ROI readouts from the GRE images into the input panel as shown on the bottom left. Click Compute, and the corresponding PDFF and R3 star value will be displayed in the table on the right. A point of note is we have begun to uh, use this online calculator in clinical practice now. Um, uh, some of our scanners are not equipped with uh, quantification sequence, and also we use this as a backup just in case uh, when you have acquisition or reconstruction failure. So in conclusion, quantification of PDFF by our template matching method is accurate against uh, standard nonlinear curve fitting method, and by implementing this, this technique as an online calculator, we hope to bring PDFF to widespread adoption uh, by making it easily accessible and cheap. So uh, I want to thank my uh, mentor, Dr. Yoku. He single-handedly came up with the idea of template matching, so kudos. And special thanks to our collaborators at the University of Wisconsin, Dr. Rita and Diego, um, for being consultants for this project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eve. <laughs> Questions? Where should we begin? There must be questions. Dr. Rofsky. 
Uh, I'm just going to make a comment. I think this concept of making online tools that are independent, that are affordable and accessible to the broad population are a tremendous contribution to the field, and I, I credit the whole team for, for contributing that fashion. Thank you. I think Dr. Grist had a question. Yeah, I, I uh, agree with that statement. Uh, maybe uh, you and perhaps Ali could comment as well on, uh, tell us about some of the uh, opportunities and limitations of these cross-institutional collaborations. What have you found to be beneficial and what are some of the obstacles in the way uh, to making progress in this? Um, for one, I think uh, uh, both Dr. Reader and Diego, uh, we, met, we met them and they gave um, very good insights to how to proceed and make some, some very good uh, corrections. Um, and and you know, it, it's a pleasure to basically work in a you know, multi-institutional, multidisciplinary um, uh, collaborations. We bring uh, different things to the table. We have different ideas, and, and marvelous thing just comes out from a mixture of those two, um, in my opinion. Well, what, what can Dr. Rosky and I do to facilitate more of these types of collaborations? And uh, <laughs> Dr. Linkinsky says money. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that's beyond my pay grade, so I'll leave you guys to talk about it. As you say, is that, is that giving money to Bob or is that taking money from Bob? <laughs> Are there, did you have to do any material transfer agreements or anything like that? Is, or is it, was it all just uh, uh, providing the opportunity for you to find each other and facilitate a collaboration? So we, we I think uh, uh, Dr. Yoko came up with the idea. And um, uh, so it, it, it really began as a funny story, actually. We, we, we wanted to basically patent this technique. So we went to our um, you know, um, intellectual property department. And, uh, and they basically came back and said, actually, Dr. Rita already had a patent on it. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that, that's where it began. And, uh, uh, and so we said, all right, so if we can't beat them, then we'll join forces with them. Uh, <laughs> is, is Tom getting the money he deserves? <laughs> <laughs> so we, we're planning to release Is that really what the question <laughs> is, Tom? <laughs> This is great. Any, any more quick questions before we take a short break? Okay, so let me just tell you, we're gonna take a very short break here, be back here in five minutes or so. You must come back. I have seen Dr. Griss' slides. You know, as a course director, I have to preview them for University of Texas uh, CME. So, so Tom, that's mainly because since you're from the Midwest, we have to make sure there are no references to Ohio State Buckeyes or Michigan Wolverines. But you assure me you're a lifelong Badgers fan, so you're, I signed the form. No problems. You're not going to want to miss this. I have seen his slides, and I can't wait to hear the delivery because they are incredible. You're going to really enjoy it. Take a short break. Don't forget to sign in for CME, and be back here in just five minutes or so if you don't mind. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Craig. Uh, we're in for a real treat. Um, my very good friend Tom Grist has uh, agreed to join us for the day, and we're very fortunate. Uh, Tom has a very, very distinguished career. Uh, Tom received his undergraduate degree in biomedical engineering from Marquette and went on to get his uh, doctor of medicine degree at the Medical College of Wisconsin, followed by a radiology residency at Duke. Um, after that, he returned to Wisconsin to become a faculty member of the Department of Radiology, ascended to run the MRI program, and ultimately in 2005, Tom became chair of the department for which he's currently serving today. The department has grown tremendously under his and leadership, uh, always known for great medical physics, but the way that Tom has brought in the clinician scientist perspective and enriched Wisconsin is something to emulate for all chairs. The current faculty is 93 clinical faculty. There are 25 fellows and 34 residents. Uh, Tom established an imaging science center in Wisconsin that has about 60,000 square feet with uh, tons of cool equipment. Um, Tom is 
internationally known for his work in magnetic resonance. Uh, he's authored four books, 16 book chapters, and over 170 peer-reviewed publications. And importantly and uniquely, he has 16 patents. And I remember one of the early ones was for a coil. And I think that there's a small, uh, a small little tow rope on his property that maybe is attributed to a knee coil. I'm not sure. But that's for a, a little skiing hobby that he has on his property, which I am envious of. Um, Tom uh, is, is a fellow of the American Heart Association, of the ISMRM, the American College of Radiology, and the SCBTMR. And Tom served as president of the ISMRM, which is a very prestigious organization that many of us belong to. Uh, I happen to serve in uh, uh, my end stage of the board, so I overlapped with Tom uh, on, in that experience. But Tom and I have had the, the really wonderful opportunity, at least wonderful from my perspective, to be overlapping in our careers for a long time, uh, starting with the early days of magnetic resonance angiography, when a bunch of crazy guys got into a room and started talking about how do you squirt gatto and get these dynamite MR angiograms, and how do we convince the world how to do this? And it was our good fortune that we were able to start lecturing together frequently, and sometimes we'd rotate with each other's crew. Uh, I had the good fortune to, to be able to, to speak with Chuck Mistretta, who's uh, one of the hi most highly regarded MR scientists who's been a member of, of Tom's department for years. Uh, Tom's also just a terrific person, and, and I think what I always watched was before I became a chair was the way that Tom's faculty really were comfortable around him. And we'd be at ISMRM and the whole crew would be there and you know having a beer and just having a good time. I said, you know what, that's something to admire. Uh, I'm grateful to Tom because when I was considering my move to a chair, uh, Tom was uh, an absolute vital resource and uh, consult and uh, there, too, you didn't get paid, did you? <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I'm really delighted to introduce Tom and welcome him to the podium to address us with his talk, Promoting Innovation Within Your Team, Practical Pearls for Pragmatic People, in which you will witness terrific teaching by tenacious Tom. Please welcome Tom. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Neil, for that kind introduction. It uh, really means a lot to me. I mean, we've had a relationship for probably uh, more than 20 years now. And I think if there's one message to the trainees about a career in academic medicine is that um, we make some sacrifices, perhaps in salary, you know, compared to our clinical colleagues in private practice, but the value of these relationships that are built with colleagues from all over the world, in my opinion, greatly outweighs uh, anything else and is uh, of really a tremendous value, these friendships. So uh, thanks for inviting me. And um, I had a great day here uh, looking at the department in the morning. And uh, there's really a lot of similarities between our two departments. These are my disclosures. Our, our department gets research support from Brocco, GE Healthcare, Hologic, and Siemens, and, and uh, I serve on some of those boards. And uh, I, I uh, made this slide after I, uh, well, I stole the idea from Neil, is that we need a graphic you know, about what our department is about at the University of Wisconsin. And as I visited here today, it's clear to me that there's so many similarities between our departments, you know. Uh, some of that is related to, we're both kind of in the middle of the country, right? And so people on the coasts are always flying over us to go to the other coast, right? And so Harvard and Hopkins and Stanford and and the UCSF, they get a lot of the credit, right, when there's tremendous good work 
being done in the heart of our uh, country. And I think the other thing that I witnessed today was the, uh, the spirit here was, is really remarkable. And uh, I think it's probably related a little bit to uh, uh, the pioneering spirit coming out from the coast, since many of your leadership team came from the East Coast um, and uh, came out to develop a department where I can feel this uh, palpable energy of everybody kind of uh, appreciating and being involved in different ways in the overall mission. I've known Ron Pishak for m more years than Neil, I think, and uh, it's really a delight to witness the transformation of the department, which had been, I think, more of a uh, community-based practice now to one that's a, really an exciting academic practice here at UT Southwestern. But the other thing I saw was you've got some pretty unique things here as well. So I had dinner last night, and this is the place I had dinner. Um, the Billy Bass Adoption Center at the Flying Fish Restaurant, which was near my hotel over at the Hilton. And, and you didn't tell me uh, to bring my Billy Bass, but I have one that uh, I could have brought here for, for adoption. Uh, when Neil came up to visit us in Wisconsin, I gave him the Wienermobile, the, the Oscar Mayer Wienermobile, which uh, I, th I think I might have seen in your office. <laughs> So uh, the scope of this lecture is to really talk a little bit about innovation, to become a little bit more practical and pragmatic about what we can do to promote innovation amongst your teams. We've seen a lot of innovation already at the research presentations, and um, this is uh, based upon a lot of more recent work, including the work of Walter Isaacson and Joan Allaire. And, uh, also, Clayton Christensen has written about this. Uh, Christensen writes more about disruptive technologies, and I won't really be talking about that as much as creating teams and what we can do to enhance uh, innovation. And um, by many accounts, what we do in medical imaging is highly impactful and highly innovative. And in this assessment by Fuchs and Sox of the um, most innovative and most impactful innovations in medicine, MRI and CT scanning, as you know, came up as number one of this survey of uh, several thousand internal medicine, medicine physicians in 2001. And likewise, within imaging, MRI, you know, is clearly at the hub of innovation and is at the center, and that's as measured by the number of publications, which seem to be at an exponential rate, and uh, the number of patents as well. It's interesting that there was a little dip here during the economic crisis of 2008 and 2009, but seems to be going on a continued very uh, favorable trajectory. And if we look at federal funding of innovation um, as measured by patents as proxies for innovation, the National Institute for Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering is perhaps one of the most impactful uh, things our government has done. If we look at the uh, number of citations per patent, which is a good measure of the impact of a particular patent, as well as the um, patents per $100 million of funding to these different centers within the NIH, you can see that the NIBIB here is at the uh, upper outer quadrant, uh, really for both the uh, citations as well as the number of patents per $100 million. So, so clearly there's a lot of innovation in medical imaging, but we ought not to take that for granted. And uh, this, if not continued uh, to be supported, could lead to problems. And some of those problems have been observed, um, and one of that observations is in the study of the Torrance kids. And E.P. Torrance set up a study in, uh, of Minnesota children in 1958 and uh, has followed the creativity of children in that region since that time. 
And in a more recent analysis of the data, Kim et al. in 1990 showed for the first time that there was a decline in some of the uh, creativity of these children. And uh, that has caused some uh, concern and has uh, led to a few publications, for example, noting the creativity crisis uh, uh, that Newsweek wrote about. So my objectives are to reflect on some of the lessons learned about innovation in MRI, understand some of the current knowledge about creativity, some of which MRI has now contributed to it, through the use of fMRI, and um, suggest how we might improve innovation both as individuals and in small groups, research teams, and in our departments and professional societies, since many of us have, con have the ability to contribute uh, to those areas, uh, to the policy around this in our professional societies. So how can we promote innovation within our team? Let's first of all talk about as individuals and small research groups. And, uh, I uh, look at those as making time for alpha waves, preparing the prefrontal cortex, and then embracing the outsider. And so this first category, making time for alpha waves, this is giving us the time to have that divergent thinking, uh, thinking out of the box. And um, a, a number, there's been a number of common themes on this, and that is in an environment where you're relaxed, happy, and maybe doing something that doesn't require a total attention, but doing something that you love, um, like taking a warm shower. How many of you in the audience have had, uh, you know, a good idea, one of your good scientific or other ideas in the shower? Raise your hands. Yeah, that, that's about the standard rate, about 30 to 40 percent, I'd say. Um, others have said, you know, going for a hike, and this is really taking that time to relax. And, and uh, this is uh, really about the role of the uh, left and right brain. And um, uh, there's research that suggests that uh, there are these alpha waves. And please, you know, Joe, I, I know I'm not a neuroradiologist. I'm just a cardiovascular radiologist. But bear with me on my interpretation of EEGs and fMRI. Uh, but uh, basically, there's this work that uh, deconstructed, the, through the use of EEGs, um, individuals who were asked to uh, solve problems and then had that epiphany, that aha moment. And what this team noticed was this burst of alpha wave activity from the right hemisphere about eight seconds before a solution was found to the problem. So this could predict that aha moment. And it's felt that these alpha waves awake these remote associations in the right hemisphere. And this is all a process that's spotting a thought inward more. And uh, this allows us to um, have those epiphanies. And uh, so uh, what is it about these alpha waves? It, part of it's noticed that uh, these are often uh, appreciated during times when we're uh, relaxed and uh, in a quiet environment or relaxed and doing something that uh, uh, allows us to focus inward. Uh, likewise, Fink and his colleagues looked at the difference between uh, the alpha wave and fMRI activity in both higher order uh, creative individuals as well as lower uh, ordinary uh, creative individuals and noticed that, uh, in fact, that the alpha wave power was significantly different between the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere in these higher order uh, creative individuals. And likewise, fMRI data no, uh, localized some of these activities to um, kind of this interconnection between uh, frontal hemisphere and a parietal lobe in the, in the right hemisphere. And in my initial kind of uh, anecdotal research in this topic, um, as one of my talks at the ISMRM, I had the chance to poll uh, many of the gold medalists for the ISMRM. These are people that really made uh, many seminal contributions to uh, the development of MRI. They have an average H, in, H index of 41, the average number of publications of 174. Um, these are many of these individuals who have made uh, 
really seminal contributions through the fields. And it was remarkable how many of these had, uh, of those that I polled, had their good idea in the shower. Um, it's not a statistical sample, I grant you that, but I talked and heard from about a dozen of those gold medalists that had their seminal idea in the shower. So does that mean we should uh, take uh, more showers, perhaps? Uh, and I won't talk about group showers. We'll talk about team building later. Uh, but uh, the other, the other uh, time for these alpha wave bursts are also perhaps after a prolonged session of intellectual focus on a particular area that we're interested in. In this case, uh, talking about the ISMRM meeting. And this was also a common theme among the gold medalists. Uh, for example, um, Klaus Prusman had uh, went to Vancouver in, uh, I think, 1997. He, he saw uh, Dan, Dan Sodickson's paper on parallel imaging using the SMASH technique. And uh, he uh, went after that conference, after really kind of totally um, focusing on MRI for a week, where we're all excited, we're going to talks, we're uh, interested in exchanging ideas, and uh, I'm always kind of a little bit exhausted at the end of that week. And uh, I think many people in the ISMRM take that week after the meeting for a little time away. The ISMRM, we tend to try to find attractive places to go to around the world. And I, I think there's a lot of value in that. So after that Vancouver meeting, uh, he went on a canoe trip in the San Juan Islands. And basically, he and his team, his lab team, were thinking about this and basically said, if, I guess if we didn't go on that trip, everything would have played out differently because his uh, idea for some of what he has done with accelerating imaging uh, was accomplished at that, after that meeting. So there, you can refer to other entities that also provide this time for us to think. And in uh, academic medicine today, we face tremendous pressures for accounting for all of our time between clinical productivity, uh, educational activities, and research activities. And in some sense, uh, I really think it's a mistake to get uh, completely focused on that. And in academics, I think it's incredibly important for us to provide some unfunded academic time for people to explore their ideas and uh, develop uh, funding avenues after that. So, Neil, I'm sorry if that just cost you a lot of money or anything, but, uh, uh, and examples of this from uh, industry are widespread. 3M, for years, had provided 15% of time for unstructured development, and uh, that's when uh, masking tape and the sticky notes were developed in some of those activities. Uh, Google, as you know, uh, had, has historically provided one day per week to pursue anything, and this is what led to actually Gmail and Google Earth, amongst other things. And so I, th I think it's very important that we try to preserve some academic time um, uh, for our faculty to pursue those interests. Well, the other uh, opportunity for these uh, for innovation is through more convergent thinking, and this is uh, through uh, what is I'd like to refer to as sweat, sadness, and failure, which really means writing grant proposals. <laughs> and uh, this is tough stuff, and uh, it's fraught with you know, challenges, and it's hard, but it gets groups together thinking about difficult problems, and we'll, uh, we'll talk more about that later. But this is really a reflection of not all creative thoughts are these alpha wave-driven epiphanies. epiphanies. Uh, and there is this relationship between the working memory in the prefrontal cortex that allows the left brain to become more involved and converge on solutions. And there's really nothing so romantic about this. This is just hard work, uh, but can be very effective as well. And there's uh, more recent data on this that uh, just came out uh, in Janu 
uh, actually in uh, neuroimaging to start with, and then some uh, recent additional work in January, uh, localizing uh, certain areas of the brain, uh, say um, in the uh, uh, frontal gyrus, and that are associated with uh, these um, innovative thought processes and are associated with higher ordinal uh, creative pre people. And these are shown to be more active here in yellow. And simultaneously, in this type of a process, there's also suppression of certain areas of the parietal cortex that um, allows some of these, uh, these uh, uh, thoughts to mature. And this is, uh, there's increasing understanding that there's a functional connectivity both between the idea generating areas of the brain as well as the areas that are tossing out the stupid ideas, right? Uh, and, and there's a dynamic interplay between those two areas. And um, so this, I, I like to, to call hard work and horizontal sharing. And let me just share an example from my experience with that. And uh, as you know, uh, Hans Wyman developed uh, gadolinium DTPA for MR contrast enhancement in uh, 1982. Martin Prince in 1994 proposed um, to do this with contrast enhanced MR angiography. That was on the background of Chuck Mastretta, who's my colleague and uh, Neil's friend here who invented digital subtraction angiography. Here he's shown with Andy Crummy in the roughly 1980s. And Chuck is the reason why I returned back to Wisconsin, because he was bored with DSA by that time, and we decided to work on MRA techniques together. And so we had started uh, doing some of this work based upon Martin Prince's work and following some of Neil's work in low dose MR gadolinium imaging. But at the same time, our research group was working on some other things. And in fact, we were um, uh, working uh, on uh, a measure of coronary flow. So uh, Martin Prince did his discovery largely through an accident by make by mixing up the syringes of gadolinium and saline and wouldn't that be a you know patient safety net report now well actually it led to his realization that if he timed the contrast uh, enhanced mr acquisition to the arrival of contrast in fact he could get some pretty good uh, images uh, but it was actually a totally a serendipitous re uh, result but at the time, uh, this is the kind of stuff we were dealing with. And uh, Neil and I have both showed this case, I think, years ago many times where uh, MR angiography without contrast techniques was fraught with these artifacts here from a metal hip prosthesis and pulse to flow artifacts using the 2D technique. And what Martin proposed was really revolutionary to inject contrast and acquire a 3D image, which really uh, ameliorated all those artifacts. But the problem was we were often faced with these uh, types of issues, these timing artifacts, in this case where the contrast hadn't arrived down in the distal abdominal aorta. It looks like there's a huge thrombus in the aorta, or in this patient with peripheral vascular disease where the contrast didn't arrive in time to opacify the femoral arteries, or in this patient where the uh, rapid return and uh, venous, rapid venous enhancement uh, overlaid the visualization of the arteries and then made it uh, very difficult to um, basically see what we're looking for. And so at this time, I was a young assistant professor in our department, and uh, these cases were often done at night because the neuro people were always using the scanner all day. And um, I would come in and I would get these, uh, these lousy scans that were mistimed. And uh, that wasn't any good. But at the same time, we were working on a grant, uh, working hard to make uh, something else work. And we were enamored with uh, measuring coronary blood flow using phase contrast MRI and calculating coronary flow reserve. 
This had been a long interest, interest of uh, Chuck Mastretta's, and as I was becoming a cardiac radiologist, this was uh, interesting to me to be able to assess the hemodynamic significance of a stenosis. But it's a really hard problem. These little one millimeter vessels moving around uh, throughout the cardiac cycle and trying to perform phase contrast measurements. At any rate, we we wrote a grant, we actually got the grant, and we started uh, exploring view sharing, where uh, we would take some of the signals from one part of the acquisition and share them with other parts of the acquisition within the R to R interval in order to uh, improve our uh, interpolated temporal resolution and to create images throughout the cardiac cycle. And uh, so we were working hard on this view sharing. It was just 2D imaging. And at one point, I got frustrated, kind of had to leave it for a while. And at that moment, uh, I thought, well, gosh, let's, let's do view sharing for 3D imaging during the contrast passage of, during the passage of contrast. So I went back to Chuck Mastretta, said, hey, Chuck, you did this before. Let's do this again. And we came up with this uh, technique for time-resolved imaging of contrast enhancement by view sharing, essentially dividing case space data into multiple different segments, oops, and um, essentially uh, acquiring those segments during the passage of contrast and then uh, reconstruct each time frame by sharing those views. So we traded the temporal footprint for a more dynamic acquisition, and therefore we were able to accelerate the acquisition by about three or fourfold. And uh, notice this is in Green Bay Packer colors, not in red and blue, the standard, but in, in Wisconsin we do this in green and gold. Um, but at any rate, we uh, were able to come up with these time-resolved 3D images by accelerating those, those uh, contrast or those image acquisition curves. And we were able to first, for the first time, um, calculate both a, a time-resolved 3D MRA and a 3D image at the, at the same time. At that time, it took about 12 hours and one graduate student to reconstruct all of the images. And what I, uh, so uh, that's a good example of horizontal sharing, working on another problem and then realizing at some point, wow, these, these issues that we're working on might be applied to a different problem. And uh, I tell Chuck that he's had you know, at least two good ideas in his career, separated by about 20 years, and they're both the same, essentially, um, DSA and some of this time result MRA. Uh, and I think that there's more recent work that suggests that uh, this type of uh, work uh, can be predicted in individuals through uh, understanding the networks that connect uh, or that uh, are enhanced or more prominent in those people that are more creative individuals. And this recently was published in PNAS where Beatty and all looked at the connectivity, the resting state functional connectivity between some of these different areas of the brains and showed that uh, in people who are higher, uh, more creative, they have a certain connection pattern that's different from uh, those individuals that are less creative. So there is a kind of a potential uh, pre-selection. So maybe uh, Neil, we should start in our faculty interviews, uh, you know, doing a little resting state fMRI uh, to see, you know, how they might fit into the uh, group. Um, so then I think the other thing that I want to comment about individuals and uh, small research groups is the benefit of uh, embracing the outsider. And... Uh, it's clear that uh, many good ideas come from outsiders when they enter into our field, and our field is filled with natural outsiders. We just don't call them that. We call them young people, right? And they're too young to know any better, and they haven't developed quite as much uh, cynicism as uh, some of us more senior uh, uh, people might have. And uh, we know this based upon literature that's all the way back to uh, Quitlet, a 19th century mathematician. 
And uh, they looked at productivity, and um, this is in work uh, summarized by Simonton, who also looked at both productivity and creativity, and really plotted this inverted uh, U-shaped curve with a fairly long tail um, in terms of creative uh, productivity. And this has been studied in a number of fields, and uh, including mathematics, astronomy, physics, all which tend to be a little bit earlier on that uh, uh, inverted U-shaped curve, and medicine tends to be a little bit later. And uh, what's a little bit discouraging is when you look at these data uh, with respect to the um, average age of the first R01 NIH grant, which I think is now 45 or something like that, individuals that are 45 years old. So we might be funding people, in fact, average, after some of the, uh, their most productive and creative years. So I think we do need to look at that. But we do know, what we do know about um, this is that team science is definitely the way to go. We saw that a lot today how everybody on those teams had a significant contribution to those teams and that that contribution is really important. And the teams continue to get larger, especially in fields like astronomy that may have you know hundreds of uh, authors on a given paper. And what we know uh, recently, I just saw this uh, in um, the uh, analysis of the grant review process at the NIH, which also showed that the number of uh, authors on publications that cited support from the NIH continues to increase. So we know that uh, team science is effective, so how can we create better teams uh, is the next question. And that's some really interesting social science in, uh, uh, about team assembly and mechanisms and the collaboration network among teams. And, uh, we heard earlier uh, from um, a couple of speakers that have collaborated between the University of Texas at Southwestern and University of Wisconsin, and that's fantastic. And ultimately, I think what it really comes down to is the personal relationships between individuals that are collaborating together. Neil and I have collaborated for years, and it's really great to see uh, our faculty then also reflect that as well. Uh, but there is some science about this, about how we can actually promote creativity amongst those teams. And it, it was uh, uh, proposed by Gumera in this article in Science in 2005. And they studied uh, Broadway musicals from 1887 to 1990. I think there were something like 1,900 Broadway musicals that they studied. And they could categorize them pretty much uh, successfully as those that were uh, fantastic successes and those that were flops, all right? And so they looked at all those musicals and then they looked at the artistic teams that created those musicals. So famous ones like West Side Story, and uh, Fiddler on the Roof that were successes, and then the, I think Gypsy and the Pajama Game were both flops, for example. And they looked at the familiarity amongst the artistic creators of those teams. And they uh, measured something called the Q. This is not the coil Q that Dr. Linkinski is familiar with, but this is a Q, a measure of social in intimacy. And they also plotted a, an inverted U-shaped curve for that in the sense that if the Q was too low, if those artists had never worked together and uh, weren't very familiar with each other, they tended to struggle to work together. And if the Q was too high, and those artists had uh, worked together too often, there weren't any new ideas. And uh, so there was nothing much new, and so those were also um, kind of not uh, good. So uh, I think it's very important to us that we continue to embrace uh, outsiders into the field to make sure that that queue is optimized. For me, uh, personally, excuse me, um, I ran into this in uh, my work early days, and I had to go back to some old material uh, that um, Dr. Linkinski is involved in, actually. Uh, we, I think, first collaborated together in 1986 or so, 1985. And I had done some work. Uh, I met this guy, Jim Hyde, who was a pioneer in uh, electron spin resonance, which is a, 
uh, kind of cousin technology to nuclear magnetic resonance. It uses a different f frequency, but it's essentially the same process only on electrons. And Jim had uh, developed these loop cap resonators, and he's a brilliant ESR kind of scientist and made many contributions. And I went to him as a medical student, and I said, hey, I heard you made these things, and, uh, and uh, yeah, you're a world famous professor in ESR, but how about making some of these things for MRI or NMR at the time? Couldn't we do that? And, and he said, well, sure, yeah. So we published this uh, paper on resonators for phosphorus NMR at 1.5 T. At that time, you know, we thought high field imaging was going to be all about spectroscopy. Boy, were we wrong. Pretty much for the most part, no offense. Uh, uh, Dr. Lindkinski or is Craig Malloy here? Or, uh, um, you know, there's a lot of value in spectroscopy, and we thought at that time it was going to change the world, but it didn't. Um, but uh, nevertheless, I got my start doing this, and, and that was helpful. And just one aside, uh, you know, I tr was trying to do that in 1984, nine, uh, so, and today, for the first time, I saw a phosphorus spectrum here from your 7T MR scanner, a phosphorus P31 spectrum. This is one excitation. That is amazing. And um, I don't think this is going anywhere anyway, but uh, <laughs> I, was, I was really impressed. It was amazing. It's like, wow, OK. I finally got, got there. But at any rate, so we had been making those coils and you know, going down to the hardware store and buying parts. There I was with some hair, actually, and with Dr. Hyde. And we were in this lab, which is the National Biomedical ESR Center, and it's this building where we were kind of confined. And it actually uh, used to be the uh, detoxification center for the Milwaukee County, all right? So uh, alcoholics would periodically arrive on the steps here and I was the only uh, medically trained person. I was the med student working with all these scientists, many of whom were from Poland or Russia, uh, that were into microwave ESR stuff. And so I would get a page when somebody showed up on the doorstep, and, uh, and they couldn't be understood, and I would escort them to the emergency room, which was a block away. And uh, so I got a page one day, and here this guy was on the front doorstep. His name is Andrzej Yasmanovich. And it turns out he's a Polish scientist, and his English was already, always terrible. And when I asked his brother about whether his Polish is, you know, w whether his English was always uh, that bad, he said, yes, and his Polish is just as bad. Uh, <laughs> But he was somewhat hard, but he was a brilliant scientist. And uh, in fact, he immigrated to Milwaukee because he was the guy um, who remembers Lech Walesa and the Solidarity Movement, which essentially brought down the Soviet Union, all right? Um, and uh, so they would organize these strikes at the shipyards in Poland. And uh, Lech Walesa got people together, and they would broadcast a message, all right, we're going to do a strike at this time at this shipyard. And um, Andre was the guy building these radio transmitters in hot air balloons, hooked up to a recorder that would have Lech Walesa broadcast a message. And they could never track down where these messages were coming from. And Andre uh, was a scientist that did this. And um, then one day, he was actually out of the country at a conference in Britain. And he got an anonymous phone call in his hotel room saying, they found out it was you. Don't come back to Poland. And he immigrated through Canada to Milwaukee. And he's working at a TV repair shop in Milwaukee. And uh, Jim Hyde found him there uh, when uh, Andre was the only guy who could pick his broken TV, and he said, hey, you know, come on over. You know something about this. So it was actually Andre that um, really led to us starting to work in other areas of MRI and to start developing all of these surface coils for MRA, which turned out to be a really good um, opportunity to translate basic research into clinical practice. And that's when I really started to understand how 
uh, powerful that could be when you could actually see the results of what you did in a clinical patient that uh, you were treating. And this led to the formation of a company and a, a lot of other work in the area. And uh, Andrei Yasmanovich, I think, was the key element. He was quite an outsider. We could hardly understand him, but he's a brilliant scientist. And uh, he subsequently became a full professor and a, um, a fellow of the ISMRM as well. He's, he's passed away a few years ago. I think the other message here in terms of diversity of teams is to, uh, we really need to collectively think about diversity also, in, not only in terms of uh, where we come from around the world and promoting ways of people to come in from around the world to join us, but also looking at the, the nature of the makeup of our teams in terms of gender diversity as well. And that's been shown to uh, promote innovation. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what we can do as leaders in medical imaging, as well as uh, for the trainees who are evaluating where they might go. Uh, these are things you might consider in terms of areas that you work or how you choose what your uh, next areas of work might be. And uh, we can promote kind of an open source environment, create urban fiction, tap uh, difficult problems, and uh, get in the flow. So first of all, in terms of the open source, I use a broad definition, and any computer scientist probably will correct me. This is not the correct definition of open source. But you know, at a certain time when MR scanners and CT scanners were just being developed, computers uh, were primarily the mini computers, right? And, and they were almost, uh, by definition, all the companies were all based in Boston. But they were very um, closed to uh, collaboration, and there was a lot of proprietary hardware and software that were unique to each company. And uh, that, in fact, proved to not be a very successful strategy because none of the collaborators could really uh, collaborate with each other, which engineers are really generally interested in doing. And uh, so, in fact, a lot of the computer interest industry moved west where there was a more of an open, collaborative environment uh, to work. And the same thought uh, could, or the same process could have been a problem in MRI. At that time, the manufacturers of imaging equipment were very closed. CT, ultrasound, and to some extent, X-ray devices were very closed. And uh, we couldn't program them. But um, it was really Felix Worley who can Maury Blumenfeld at GE, that a lot of the knowledge in NMR was outside of the manufacturers, but it was in these really brilliant chemists and spectroscopists that had the content knowledge in NMR, like Dr. Linkinski. And I think this is an older photo of you in the front of a GE scanner. Uh, and um, the... Uh, the fact is that uh, at that time they made a critical decision that uh, we were going to they were going to open this up and create a research platform on the GE scanner and uh, Philips and Siemens and the other manufacturers I think followed suit recognizing that okay we've got to leverage this intellectual environment outside of the company and uh, uh, Maury Blumenfeld who was one of the pioneers in uh, early. Uh, dissemination of MRI, uh, stated the value became evident when Dick Eman and some of his colleagues came, came to GE to show us how to eliminate uh, pulsating uh, artifacts from pulsating blood. And Dick Eman is widely credited with, credited with uh, the SAT pulses that we all use every day and pretty much ignore. So um, the, the, I think what we can take home on this is uh, we need to continue to build these tools in this toolbox to share data and to share uh, tools for us to work with uh, imaging. And, and so I'm very encouraged whoops, uh, by the fat and water collaboration activities and the toolbox that's being built by uh, those um, in that area. The other thing we can do is create urban friction and look for places that we see this. And I was really excited today to see that there are uh, physicists embedded next to radiologists in your lab area here. 
and the labs are close to the leadership offices and faculty are close to um, uh, other engineers and chemists and graduate students and, and that's, that's great. And I think that is recapitulating what I would call that urban friction. And this is um, based on some similar social sciences data. Lewis Betancourt studied basically why are cities, why do they work? We take all these people and um, he was able to show that actually the creativity went uh, and was scaled by the population times 1.05. So there was a greater advantage in these urban environments where there's a lot of interactions, friction, and criticism. And uh, so we can do this. It's known that if we just do brainstorming, that doesn't necessarily work. You need that critical process as well. And it's the imperfection of ideas that cause us to listen. And so in our societies, I think something like the annual meeting of the ISMRM, that's like the New York City of MRI. Uh, but it's also these workshops and study groups that are very valuable, which create that uh, more Greenwich Village-like uh, uh, creative environment. And uh, so we continue to try to support that in the ISMRM by providing uh, grants for students to attend these workshops because that's really an area where um, students can have more direct access to the faculty and I think we need to continue to do things like this. And um, there's been scientific work to suggest that yes, there is a lot of value in uh, looking, in co-locating scientists from different disciplines. And I think I'm not going to go into this in, this in detail, but Lee and co-workers uh, proved that the impact, as measured by the number of citations of papers, went up when we tried to co-locate individuals. And they studied the uh, Boston area uh, scientific collaboration in the healthcare campus. So what we've done at Wisconsin is similar to what you've tried to do here. This is our, our medical campus, the hospital here, the uh, uh, health, uh, the learning uh, center there, VA over here, and when we built um, our Imaging Sciences Research Center, where imaging is the uh, bottom two floors of this and a wedge and another floor of here, and there's, there's other research activities like uh, prostate cancer, breast cancer, other foci of research elsewhere in these buildings. We wanted imaging to be the basis for this as well as to create a, a reason for people to come down to the imaging center to have those random interactions, and that's why we put coffee right in the middle of it all. Okay, and then finally, I just want to say um, what can we do uh, as departments, and that I think is, I'd say, get in the flow and encourage these group alpha waves. And um, this guy with this impossibly difficult pronounced name, Chicken Santamali, um, has this theory of flow, that when we get in the flow state, um, which is a unique, uh, uh, kind of line of regression here where our skills and our challenges are plotted and if our challenges exceed our skills too much, we get anxious. If uh, our skills are way higher than the challenges that we face, that's boredom. And so to get in this sweet spot is really important. And uh, well, for example, I like to windsurf. Um, this would be kind of boring there. Uh, this would be a little too exciting uh, there, uh, uh, too much of a challenge. Uh, but to get in the flow state is, is really critical. And, and for me, uh, personally, um, I like to have something that's completely different than work periodically to get in that flow state, like skiing or mountain biking or windsurfing. I think for Neil, it might be playing music. And, for uh, those uh, trainees in the audience, I think it's really good to have that balance uh, of something that gets you completely off of uh, work. And, uh, oh, well, there's Neil himself jamming here. And uh, there is some data here also that there's some neural substrates for spontaneous musical performance. Uh, and there, uh, Lim and Brown did a study using fMRI to kind of understand this flow state. And here again, 
uh, it, uh, I think what we know is that there's this dynamic, dynamic interplay of activity in certain areas of the prefrontal cortex and then suppression of other areas that ordinarily suppress some of our, uh, or are the more critical thought areas of our brain. And um, so I, I think this is a, a really healthy thing to do for us as individuals, but I think it's something we can also promote um, amongst our teams and our departments. And the example I take from here just in the last few minutes is uh, picking really hard problems and charging a group with attacking that problem. So the one I like to use is uh, phase contrast MR. We saw some work with the 4D flow earlier today, and we've been working with that, I'd, I'd say, for about now uh, 18 years or so. And at the time when we started the acquisitions using conventional acquisition techniques, if we wanted to reconstruct a cardiac-gated 3D flow acquisition, which uh, gives us a multi-dimensional flow uh, exam, um, the acquisition times using uh, conventional techniques for 40 minutes to four hours potentially, which of course are clinically impractical. And uh, it is at one of our fishing meetings that uh, Chuck Mastretta here came up with this idea, completely for a different reason, but uh, here, here is Scott Reeder there, uh, somewhere I'm in there. This is a meeting that we all go up to Canada, radiologists and uh, medical physicists and engineers. We give lectures to each other in the morning, and then we fish all day, and then we give lectures in the afternoon. And during those fishing times, there's often some really good uh, ideas that are generated and the um, and during the lectures here Fred Lee started a company and recently sold that to Johnson & Johnson for fractions of a billion dollars and you know, that, that kind of came up at this uh, some of these ideas came up at these fishing meetings so it's been well worth it uh, on many levels and uh, here Chuck at that time you know, uh, we were talking about something else. He said, well, why don't we use a radial projection reconstruction? That the spatial resolution is kind of independent of the number of samples. And uh, if it's a sparse data set, we can uh, kind of undersample it and then accelerate the imaging, basically. And he was actually thinking of CT colonography, which didn't make any sense. But for MR phase contrast, it did make a lot of sense. And so we developed these techniques using undersampled projection reconstruction. Here's just a comparison using um, a conventional techniques about a seven minute acquisition. And then now a seven minute acquisition gives us whole brain coverage. And uh, this coupled with the you know, ability, the enhanced ability to process these 4D flow um, acquisitions has really uh, allowed us to take what was once a very difficult problem and now translate that into clinical practice. And it has been a complete uh, group effort, uh, not only at UW, but also in collaboration with Michael Markle at Freiburg and University of Illinois, I mean, uh, and Northwestern uh, University in Illinois. And um, I think from my perspective as a radiologist, it is really exciting to be able to see this and to be able to witness the translation of that basic science idea all the way to our clinical practice to benefit one of our patients. And uh, this was the first clinical case that I actually interpreted in a patient with a type B aortic dissection with persistent pain and ischemia. And we did this 4D flow measurement, which you can appreciate that uh, the flow through the true lumen is very high. And then during most of the cardiac cycle during diastole, the true lumen is completely obliterated by the back pressure from the false lumen. Uh, we really couldn't figure out with conventional CTA what exactly was the problem with this particular patient. And it was a 4D flow that allows us to convince the surgeons that it was this process that was taking place and the patient was treated with an endo endovascular uh, stent graft and the, and the uh, uh, abnormalities were corrected. So I think that we ought not to take it for granted that we as radiologists really have a unique capability to see that whole uh, process from basic discovery to implementation in clinical practice. And it's something that, uh, that I personally cherish and uh, 
we should continue to support. So in summary, uh, in terms of enhancing innovation as individuals, we can make time for alpha ways. Uh, remember that uh, hard work and horizontal sharing, even though it seems painful at the time, often can yield really good results. And then embrace the outsider in our research groups. As uh, leaders of radiology teams, I think we need to continue to embrace this open source environment, create uh, urban friction, and uh, to really embrace internationalism as well, which is incredibly important, and to identify you know, those hard topics, those stretch goals that our teams often, even if they don't achieve those goals, can really achieve something else. If we do that, uh, I think we will improve human health for centuries to come. I want to acknowledge my colleagues at UW and spend a brief moment uh, shameless advertising for you trainees. Come on up. It might be a little cold. The summers are really nice. Uh, and uh, we have a lot of great things going. And um, we are located right here, the capital of Wisconsin, up in Madison. We are right next to the university campus on an isthmus between two lakes, a geographic uh, structure. And uh, it combines this wonderful kind of campus feel with um, the state capital and our, our beautiful lakes. So come on up and visit. And uh, that's the end of my shameless recruiting, <laughs> except I will just add one other little tidbit that uh, this year Aunt Minnie uh, named us the best uh, radiologist training program. Um, I'm seating UCSF, who had been winning this award for many years. It was my pleasure to give uh, Ron Aronson that news. And uh, we have many fellowships. So thank you very much for your attention, and thanks for hosting me. Tom and and uh, and uh, present him with a small token of our appreciation for your, your time spent here for a terrific lecture where you brought together so many disciplines. I'm thinking about we saw fMRI, um, we saw social sciences, we saw a little geography there. We <laughs> saw uh, shameless, uh, you know, plugging for a program. Um, Many, many skills that I'm not well versed as. <laughs> but really, Tom, thanks for a terrific, inspirational talk, provocative uh, and entertaining. Really appreciate right, it. Thank thanks you. for being part of today. <laughs> I'd just like to make some closing remarks. Um, Research Day has uh, been such a wonderful addition to our program. And uh, I would say that, that Craig really articulated it well in the beginning when he stated that this program is meeting our hopes and dreams as we initially uh, thought of this program, as we initially conceived of it. And you know, it's really wonderful to set an aspiration, to set a big vision, to have a little audacity in that vision and to watch it come to fruition. And today is an example of that. The quality of the research, the abundance of the research. Um, well, I, you know, it gives me such pride to look out on all of you here, all the participants, uh, and to know that you're part of a great program uh, and you make it great. And for that, I am very, very thankful. Uh, today, as a special day, I'd like to just offer a few thanks. Um, there's no way we can have such an event without the contributions of many people. So the committee behind the scenes that's doing so much, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Cristala Edwards, Irene Delgado, John Guerin, Lindsay Gilson, Stacy McElroy, Nicole Paul, Ursula Taylor, Pamela White, Latoya Wright, Sonia Hill, Jocelyn Shafolius, Glenn Katz, Alandis Young, and Melody Reeves. The judges play an important part. Uh, Lakshmi Anantakrishnan, Tim Booth, uh, Bashak Dogan, Ivan Pedrosa, Marco Pino, Shankai Sun, and Elena Vinogradov. Um, really have to acknowledge Craig and Bob for spearheading this terrific day. But frankly, the special thanks do have to go to Bob Linkinski because this is his conception 
and it's his creativity and his passion for science and mentorship that has really uh, been responsible for this wonderful day that we all share and joy in. So I'd like to thank you all, but why don't I give a special thank you to Bob. <laughs> what I neglected to do is to give Tom an opportunity to, to answer some questions. So do we have some questions, perhaps, for, for Tom? So I often felt uh, sort of like an outsider in research and through my career, and I noticed that when I was watching your, your presentation, it was pretty much all male, you know, throughout time. And I don't, is there an ISMRM female gold medal winner? Yes. Hetty won, right? Yeah, Hetty and Joan Ingwall, I think. John, yep. and, and, Carla. and Carla. I think Carla won. Oh, and three. Uh, okay. But yeah. anyway, how, what do yeah. you do in your program, in your place, to you know embrace the outsider? Make sure you've got your young women faculty and your younger people of color, or someone you know who just d thinks differently or looks differently than you. How do you uh, encourage your group to make those kind of teams? Yeah, right. That's a really good question. Um, and I think that uh, there's, a, there's a few things. I think uh, women in uh, science and medicine, uh, often at a very critical time of their career, are also um, facing other uh, things at home, you know, perhaps trying to raise a family and uh, feeling um, like uh, the time is of a critical element. And so um, I know that some radiology practices don't allow part-time people. I think that's a terrible mistake because I think people ought to be able to adjust. And so we promote that or allow that when necessary and try to, um, uh, try to encourage a, a balanced view of that. And some of my part-time women faculty are some of the most productive faculty we have. Um, and I sometimes get worried that uh, they're doing too much work off the clock. And so yeah, that yeah, also, yeah, yeah. yeah you're right. You can be certain yeah, time. right, like we, we all are. But uh, yeah, that's, that's an issue. But um, I think also uh, identifying role models and uh, who have been through that experience. And as, as time goes on, there are more uh, role models, and that's, that's really good. You, you know some of them. Um, we also have promoted a uh, women in radiology interest group that has actually uh, developed a whole uh, kind of professionalism program, not just for women, but for everybody in the department. And it kind of, it, it helps us by bringing a different perspective to everybody in the department. Um, but I certainly don't have the, the answer. And we're, we're trying hard, um, especially with, uh, in faculty in the uh, medical physics, engineering, and um, those the harder sciences, it's, it's been tough. Yes, Lakshmi. at the, the side of the gold medalists, and um, my chairman when I was a resident was one of them, uh, Mike Modick, and he always used to talk about the good old days where they could just throw somebody on the scanner or throw whatever, you know, yeah. time wasn't an issue, as much regulation wasn't an issue, and now um, the, not to, uh, patient safety and patient privacy are obviously extremely important concerns, mm -hmm. but it seems like there's a lot more red tape, if you will, to um, to getting research done, um, so I guess my thoughts are my my question is what what are your thoughts on current day climate as far as reg as far as regulation and whether that has hampered in, uh, creativity? Yeah, right. It's a good question. I think uh, actually I sense that the uh, regulatory environment uh, pendulum swung. One way to uh, really uh, suppress and, and create a, a very difficult processes 
uh, and to suppress some of the pace of innovation. My sense is that's swinging back a little bit. Um, I won't get political, uh, but maybe there's something there. Uh, but in our hands, I think as uh, in the last 10 years, one of our biggest challenges has been these academic industrial partnerships and the regulation around conflict of interest and conflict of commitment and the impact that that has on research studies. And I think that pendulum had really swung, mostly driven by the manufacturer's interpretations of rules. That seems to be coming back. And uh, I think we've, um, we've worked with our you know, IRB to try to bring it back. It is a problem elsewhere. There seems to be a lot of variation from uh, site to site and, and how vigorous the IRBs are and, and how, uh, how restricted the conflict of interest committees are and um, those, those things. So I don't know. I think er all of that is probably local and there are a lot of variations, but I do feel like it's coming back a little bit. Yes. Let's just get a mic on it, Avnish. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That was a fantastic talk. I mean, I learned a lot about team science. It's, it's great to see University of Wisconsin collaborating with our department. My experience has been different. It's a controversial thing. So I've gone all over the country in the last 10 years, I would say eight years, and established protocols for NYU, Brigham, all these places. I've scanned patients for them. But next time when you meet these guys in the meetings, if I've established something for, say, UK, I give a webinar yesterday, and they invite you, and they'll say, you know, we are giving a webinar, but we'd like Abneesh also to talk in there. While in the US, all these people you meet in the meetings, they'll say, oh, Abneesh, we are almost there to compete with you. That's kind of response on the face. Hmm. So how good are radiologists collaborating? So that's my concern there. I think that, again, is probably, uh it comes down to personal relationships. Yeah, and uh, yeah, there are areas that I can point to, like in the 4D flow stuff. Yes, we are probably competing with University of Freiburg and then Northwestern University when Michael Markle moved there. But uh, you know, ultimately, I think if you focus on what's in the best interest of the patient in the long run, that that stuff will sort itself out. And so I guess, if I s sense that two teams are competing, I'll ask them to just focus, all right, how can we get this technology or how can we move this field forward as fast as possible to uh, benefit human health, which is what we're all trying to do. So um, yeah, maybe I that's a that message. Point, but I see resistance from radiologists. Like, I don't know, it's a physician thing or. Huh. Thank you. So Tom, I, I have a comment about that. I mean, I agree with you that relationships matter, but, but the uh, funding system matters a lot, too. So in Europe, there's an encouragement for multi-center collaborative uh, trials. They, they actually, the European Union supports them. You'll find many institutions collaborate with each other and team science. Here, we're individual competitors. Yeah. And right. so we always feel like we're competing for the same grant dollars. And so a, uh, a culture grows up where sharing may look like it's antithetical to that when in fact it isn't. Mm -hmm. And so that's a hard thing to overcome when you're looking at individual accounts versus what teams can produce. Yeah, and balancing those two things off is really a challenging effort in the United States. Right. And I think that uh, we, even the academic environment, uh, continues to support that individualism rather than the team teamwork, and I think we need to develop promotion mechanisms that recognize that, all right, uh, each of us may have a different contribution that's significant, but may not reflect, all right, developing your own lab as the PI. Uh, there was one more, there. Hi, uh, thank you very much for a very uh, great uh, overview of uh, creativity and different things. My question is, often we, there is this critique of current funding principles that most creative ideas that truly disrupt will not get funded, not in the initially, and there are very few mechanisms that really promote uh, something outside of the system. So what do you think of that? And in general, how do you think it's possible to bring together these great uh, hot shower relax moments with uh, 
blood, greed, and uh, of NIH review process. Uh, it's yeah. impossible to. Yeah. I think there again, you know, balancing. There's uh, different times for each approach. You're going to have the sweat and blood, sweat and tears, I guess, with the NIH. Uh, but making sure you take some time after that grant is in to, you know, uh, make time for alpha waves. Uh, Do you think our current uh, climate helps with innovation and uh, really creative ideas? Or because many times it comes back from the study section saying, "Oh, there is not pre enough preliminary data. There is not enough, uh, you know, pre-existing." Uh, yeah, right. Uh, it seems to me that some of the most successful NIH-funded investigators they they've already had the work done when they submit the grant, and the grant is really for the next grant, right, or the next body of work, and so. You know, unfortunately, that's the way it is. I think, given that, though, it's, we still have this incredible uh, NIH process for delivering money that I hope, you know, is maintained, you know, because it really is troubling when I heard from somebody, oh, it was uh, Yvonne, you know, 11 percentile on a grant and it, you know, didn't get funded. You think, oh, my gosh, yeah. Uh, that that's that's tough, and and the, it becomes a signal and noise problem because there's so much noise in the in the evaluation process. I think where this what I'm really a, a little bit worried about maybe an opportunity though is the pace of change is now going so fast with some of the um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning in imaging, and. Wow, that is going way faster than our review process or evaluation process can possibly keep up. And some of those uh, ideas will be old ideas by the time they get to the, you know, review committee. I, that's in the, in the next couple of years, that's kind of what I'm worried about is how we invest in that, but at the same time do it at a pace that matches the pace of innovation. Any more questions? If not, join me once again in uh, congratulating Tom for a great and stimulating talk. And thank you, everyone. We're adjourned. Have a great evening.